It sounds like it happened in 1937, though. But it's called the Iran Experts Initiative. Oh, wait, you just linked the exact article that I think I read on this. I don't know what this website is or if this is a good site or not. Um, semaphore. I, d I didn't go over this on stream, did I? I think I just read this on my own. It's an interesting article with them trying to, basically just talking about how they, I guess, vie for influence internationally. But, okay. Back here. This might be the reason why Hillary Clinton once said that our Qatari friends keep telling us that the Muslim Brotherhood are a peaceful organization. Peaceful organization. You know, the emblem of the, the Muslim Brotherhood are two swords, curved swords, two swords. Uh, one, is, one sword is for the hugs and one for the kisses. Okay? The, and this is a peaceful organization. And this is what she means. Our Qatari friends keep telling us. Well, the, the money, the Qatari money tells us to say this. And uh, they buy politicians, they buy academic, and they buy pe pe people in, 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 the, in the media. And unfortunately, people like to be bought by Qatari money because this money has no, 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 no limit. Um, I remember what I was going to say about when you're writing about going into solutions in uh, the West Bank and Gaza as well, uh, you're not shy about saying that you think it's actually a good thing to keep uh, these suppose, like, supposedly future Emirate areas dis like, disconnected from each other through settlement expansion. Uh, why, should you, feel, why should I feel bad about it? Oh, no, I just imagine I a lot... solution which will be good for everybody. Yeah, so I'm just saying that um, when you Except for make the... Except the themes of the PA. Okay. Uh, when you make the rationale for that, it seems to be like you tend to put as a security justification first as in it gets rid of the threat. But then side by side with that, there's the other argument that, uh, especially with Jerusalem, like you argue that this has been our land for 3,000 years. I, the security goes along with good economy. Mm -hmm. Security goes along with good life. Security goes on with uh, uh, social stability, which is the basis of everything. It, it is a, it's a holistic way how to look at things. If you establish a state with many clans, many groups, they will end up fighting with each other, just like it is in Syria. Because they will always fight who will lead the conglomerate. Once every group has its own leader, its own prime minister, its own president, who will fight whom? What about? This is the idea. that When a clan rules itself, it doesn't fight others. It doesn't look for enemies. It doesn't need enemies. Just based on what he recommended me, that's not true. Clans do look for enemies, um, especially in the Middle East. Clans were constantly looking to expand, to extract more resources from neighbors, um, to basically gain advantages to, to boost their own status. So I don't know why he would think that just because they're restricted to a state, they wouldn't. If he believes that they're so heavily um, part of these clan systems from, from old Arab lives, uh, I don't know why he thinks that it would stop at the borders of a state. But I don't know to create enemies in order to galvanize people under one ages. They don't need it. Only countries like Syria, who are sharply divided inside between all kinds of divisions, they need external enemy. What do you think Assad did, Hafez Assad, did not join Sadat in the peace which we signed with Sadat in 1979? Jimmy Carter promised him, promised uh, Hafez Assad, that if you join this peace, you will get the Golan entirely. Just like Sadat, who got the Sinai Desert entirely, you'll get the same thing. He didn't want it. Why? He needed Israel as an enemy in order to, fr to threaten his people. That if you don't come under my legitimate ages, the Zionists will come and kill you. And he, need, he didn't need a war. He needed a state of war with Israel. And this is why he didn't want the Golan back to that degree. Hmm. He needed the state of war with Israel. And uh, of course, because he, his personality was tarnished. He was accused in Syria in, 1990, in 1967 when they lost the Golan, when he occupied the Golan. He was accused personally that because of his behavior and the fact that he actually kicked out half of the 
uh, the officers of the army in 1966 when he took over the country with Salah Jadid, who was the first president of the Ba'ath, uh, he was actually accused personally for the loss of the Golan. And uh, how do I know? He lost the Golan on June 10, 1967. In which day he died? June 10, 2000. Mm. He couldn't take it anymore. Mm. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, hypothetically, if, let's imagine people in uh, Palestinian territories decided to give up on what you call the, the clan mentality and they decided to agree to come under like a unified, like an actually unified national identity and they would accept a state roughly on the Clinton parameters, six, seven borders, and that security wouldn't be an issue. If, what do you mean, you know? They start to marry each other regardless of clan? Yeah, it's like, just say, imagine. Yeah. Okay, well, so well, imagining, this, talk to me. yeah, so if this happens, would you be okay with giving up the... Again, I am looking for the group, mm -hmm. one group which can carry a state and not multiple groups like Syria and Iraq. Mm -hmm. If I see in the future that a girl in Hebron can freely marry a boy from Nablus and vice versa, they don't, you know, in these societies, they don't. Again, I just, I never heard this. I only asked one person. It was the guy who was giving me a tour in um, East Jerusalem and in um, and Ramallah and in the surrounding refugee camps. I asked him this question. He said he'd never heard this before, which makes me, I don't know how true this is, that somebody from one of these cities couldn't marry somebody from another city. I'm, I don't know. I just haven't heard this before. ...have marriages of hmm? boy and a boy, or girl and a girl, okay? So this is why I say, particularly, girl and a boy. We are still not there. If this happens in the future, I will change. But so far, you cannot see one sex uh, marriage in... Corey said he heard that a lot in his interviews. Okay. ...this place. If they want, they go somewhere else. Now, if, when I see that the clans of Hebron are marrying freely, with the clans of Nablus and so forth. And actually the clan system dissolves because of generations of marriage between clans. It means the clan system is, is um, diminishing. Then I might, I might uh, speak differently. But right now, since we want to solve the problem now, according to the givens, according to the characteristics of this society, as it is now, you have no other choice but the clan system, which will carry uh, the Emirates on it. So to you, in a, in a different world, you think, yeah, in this different world, it would be worth giving up uh, land in the West Bank in exchange for peace? When the situation changes and we find in front of us another kind of people, we will have a recalculation of the old accounts. Even but but to, to, to wait until the Palestinian society, or societies, actually, because mm -hmm. they, they, are, they divide themselves. If the Palestinian societies become one consolidated society, it will take maybe three, four hundred years, no less. How do I know? Even in Israel. Look, 20% of the population in Israel are Arabs. Most of them are Muslims, some are Christians, some are Druze. And uh, you can see until this very day, and we are talking about 76 years of the existence of the state of Israel, and their friction with us, and we are a very liberal society, individualistic society. It means everybody mirrors whoever he wants, he or she wants, regardless of anything. Okay? Uh, they live with us, they see us, in the university, in the workplace, in the public sphere, we are, we live with them. You still think, you still see within the Arab sector in Israel how the, how important the clan is in their life. And sometimes it's how to to understand how come people who speak Hebrew, you know, fluently. Because the workplace, because of the school, because of the university, because of everything, they they, you know, they go, you know, like us in the vacations to the beach, and they are with us in the movie theater, in the opera theater. They with with us, almost many of them, especially those who live in the cities, 
they are Israelized, I would say. Um, what are your thoughts on the recent directive by the Oklahoma State Superintendent that grades 5 through 12 must be taught about the Bible and Ten Commandments in class? Is there any chance it's even remotely constitutional? Uh, no clue? Sounds super cringe. In the lifestyle. They didn't become Zionists, but they are Israelites in their lifestyle. Yet, in many cases, a girl doesn't have an option to marry somebody who is out of the clan because they are Mushmin still. Less in the cities, more in the villages, and much more within the Bedouins in the Negev. Okay, I'm curious. A little too excess. I just want to hear some of this, I guess. Would you marry someone from Gaza or Hebron? Palestinian societies will try particularly when it comes to marriage. I want to test this. Note that in Palestinian societies, it's expected that women. <laughs> It's still expected that women's father slash family agree to who she will marry, and a woman is expected to move to the area her husband comes from. Okay, that was way too fast. Hold on. No. Why? In Gaza, Khalil, Gaza, yes. Hebron, no. Okay, so why Gaza, yes? This is, they're in Ramallah? Is that where they're in right now? Lish. Because they have a seat. Okay, oh, it's actually, I mean, it's a good reason. Second, why have Ron no? I said Manal. Come on, tell us the truth, let's go. I don't know. I'm gonna say them in Arabic. Kudiri. You know the Hebronite. Um, tell me, he said no. Okay, so so translator, why why do you think people in this area don't seem to like the idea of marrying a Hebronite? <laughs> Come on, someone's got to tell you the truth. Because of the different mindset, they just think in, in a different way. Okay, and from we what consider I consider ourselves a bit more modern than them okay. in some ways. Okay, fair enough. Um, and in your parents' generation or grandparents' generation, was it the same? No, they would never marry somebody from outside their own uh, village or town because they would prefer to keep everybody close. Ah. ah, true. Then it was harder to get around. So, yes, the question was, would you marry someone from Gaza? Uh, and you I, said your parents wouldn't be happy? My, yeah. Okay. They will not agree. I don't think that, so. Uh, you don't I, think they would allow you? Yeah. And you don't think you would? No. I can see that this face on your face. Okay, well, at Hebron. No, 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 no. Yeah, well, why? Okay, why Hebron? No, 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 no. What's with Hebron? <laughs> North and South here in Palestine uh, not have uh, th uh, the same idea, the same thinking, okay. same thought. So people here in Nablus think differently than yeah, people in... in... Okay, can you give me an example of something in Hebron that they... a way they think, which is backwards? A girl here, maybe you can uh, go to a restaurant. It's very... To on her own or with friends? With friends and love. Yeah, and true. But in Israel, I don't they will love this. You're actually right. I, I was, I, I, I was told that I too. Don't know. Maybe it's more uh, than in Palestine. So a girl, just, a can, uh, girl can't go with her friends or on her own maybe, somewhere yes. at night? Um, okay. would, you, would you marry someone from Gaza? Uh, yeah. Of course. Yeah? Wait, she like said, us? yeah. She shook her head and said, yes. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I'm not American, sorry. Okay, so, which She's one so, do you mean? She's, She's yeah, actually yeah. blushing. Okay. okay. It's, it's your cute. opinion. There's no right and wrong answer. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I know, I know. It's uh, my opinion. Yeah. If he's Palestinian, yeah, why not? So, okay. Like us. Okay, so Gaza, Nablus, it doesn't matter yeah, where they come from. Would you marry someone not Palestinian? Just curious. But hmm? But not uh, Israeli. Oh, you'd marry anyone but Israeli? Yeah. Okay. She clarified. Arab. Arab. She has to be Arab. Eh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I can't uh, I'm not judging you. <laughs> no, I don't have... Uh, no. A problem with yeah. non-Arabs. مستعدين تتزوجوا حدا من الخليل أو من غزة؟ لا. I would love to go to Gaza. I would never. ليش؟ خلاص مبدأ. الخليل أو الغزة أزوا. 
نخليه الاولى الغزه ازوا ليش خلاص اي ودنت ماري فروم ايذر وان واي اي جست كوز Uh, Something that's so hard. I think you would have to do like more sit down interviews and like really talk it out. Um, I'm curious if because there are so many reasons why you would say no to this. So they're just simple questions. Like one reason might be that you've heard something about these people, but you've never seen them before. So you're like, no, fuck no, I don't think I would marry somebody there. A second reason might be because of uh, maybe they, there are genuine ideological differences between the people that live in these towns, like that one girl said. Another one might be because of the idea that like families shouldn't marry certain families, uh, like the thesis of that book, uh, or I guess the thesis of Qadar. Um, another reason might be um, impracticality of it. I'm not going to go travel somewhere else and marry somebody else. They don't know where they'd live afterwards. Uh, I feel like I need more than just like one question. Um, I, I, it'd be interesting to hear somebody speak more at length about this, but I, I don't know if I'm going to get that in this video. They have a diff, they have a difficult. Are they hiding this clan issue? Is it a sensitive issue? No one wants to mention, or is it not to do with this? I, I it's impossible for me to say. I can't based on like, because the questions are very simple. So it's hard to, um, it's just hard to say. Mindset. A difficult mindset that we're talking Also, about. keep in mind, like, there could be that pressure, but these people might not even know about it. So, like, for instance, um, like a form of, like, non-genetic inheritance almost, like, where you tell a, a daughter or a son over and over again, like, hey, like, you can't go. Uh, we don't talk to these people. We don't like them, blah, 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 because they're just, they're way different than us and fuck them. The, the parent might be, you know, conveying to the child, like, oh, well, we just don't do it because they're different. The parent might be thinking, well, we don't do it because it's outside of our particular, like, you know, lineage in terms of who we'd want to have, uh, have children with. But like the ch so the child might get that, but they don't get it directly. Like I, I don't know. I, these types of things have to be done in like a longer conversation. I think to to really know, it's hard to just look at um, to look at like very simple answers and then just say, oh, it must be because of this reason, you know? Like even in the U.S., like if you ask somebody, like you ask a white guy, like, hey, would you ever date a black girl? You know, the guy might say no, but he could be saying no for a million different reasons. You truly have no idea, right? The guy himself might not have any idea if he's never even like seen like. Uh, if he hasn't been socialized around different races or he lives like in a heavily, heavily white area, he might not even have any idea, so. Gazans or Hebron? The Hebronites. The Hebronites have a different mindset. Okay, explain the different mindset. Nobody knows who you are. Difficult mindset. Difficult. Explain a difficult mindset. Tijani Sabian. Traditions and customs. They're very restrained. We used to go to university and you would see the the young people from Hebron. They're very restrained. Okay. I love people from Gaza. Says another one. Says another one. Yes. Okay. Whose name is, you know, silence, but she has nothing to do with silence. Like, okay, Lish. Lish. I just like them. I love them from okay. from long ago. Okay. Wait, you know people in Gaza? Oh, ah, so she's just basing this on politics, so. Based on anything. Not based on everything. Everything. everything based on, based everything. on everything, but she doesn't know anyone. Else. Okay, fair enough. Um, would you marry someone from Gaza? Uh, Who are you married, first of all? Uh, I should check. Married, okay. Would, okay, uh, would you, 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 let's say your children, is it okay if they marry someone from Gaza? Actually, no. Why? Because it's uh, two different areas, two different cultures. So what's the difference between culture of Hebron and the culture of Gaza? Uh, first of all, it's far away from us. That's true. We have to keep uh, our children here. Uh, second, uh, it's uh, different uh, traditions. So give me an example of a tradition that's very foreign from Gaza, you know. Uh, I, I really, I don't know. Okay. But because it's far away from us. Okay. Is it the same from someone from Nablus? See, this could be the thing too, that like, they're in their minds, they're thinking geographically, but that could be a proxy for clan-based stuff and they don't realize it. Or it could literally just be practical reasons. Um, but I, you just have to ask so many more questions to figure out like what's driving the thought here. It's hard to know, right? <clears throat> no, it's different. Nablus uh, have an uh, hour and a half from Hebron, but Gaza. You... Sorry for Americans. Um, an hour and a half drive is a, is a long drive. <clears throat> okay, Europeans and people in the Middle East stuff sometimes think that these are far distances to drive. No, it's different. Nablus uh, have an uh, hour and a half from Hebron. But Gaza, you need authority. Yeah, you need permission. permits. Yes, permits. 
Okay. If, let's say, we it's a better situation, and you don't need permits to go into Gaza, and you can go easy, freedom of movement, it's easy, would that change your mind, or it's still because of the cultural differences? Yeah, I have uh, my, uh, still I have uh, the same decision. It's different. Okay. Uh, Just because it's different cultures. Okay. Different Fair cultures. Enough. Would you marry someone from Gaza or Hebron? No, I am. Uh, I love to marry in Nablus. Okay, why? Why only someone in Nablus? Uh, because um, because I understand. Oh. Keep your eyes. Okay. Um. They don't want to sound racist, LOL. Uh, Nobody in this region gives a fuck about sounding racist like people in America do. Trust me, it would never be about that. There might be other things that they're sensitive about, but it has nothing to do with sounding racist or not. Trust me. Uh, family and understand to me. Yes. Okay, now is part of it because you have to move to the the man's area? That's what's expected? Um, no. You marry someone from Ramallah. Do you have to move to Ramallah? Marry to Ramallah? Yes. Why not? No, she didn't understand. Is it to get married from Ramallah? You have to go to Ramallah? If I get married from Ramallah, I have to go to Ramallah. I have to go to Ramallah. It depends on the husband. Also. Yes. Okay, so it's not for sure. So it really depends on who it is. But someone from Hebron or Gaza, no? No, no, no. No Hebron or Gaza. Okay, no. why? I refused. <laughs> and I refused. And I followed. But why? No, 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 uh, because the, the thing and the, uh, ah, there's a difference of there's just no, no. a huge difference. There's just no, yes, a difference there's no of compa uh, compatibility. <laughs> okay. يعني إنه كمان برضو different في العادات والتقاليد. إيش بتحكوها أنتوا العادات؟ Habits, yes. Traditions. Uh, yes. Traditions and uh -huh. norms and culture. Okay. Yes. Are these Arabs or Jews being interviewed? These are all Arabs living in the West Bank. Palestinians living in the West Bank. Wait, actually, I don't. I shouldn't say that. They all, they should all be Palestinians or Arabs. I think so far it's been people living all on the West Bank, right? But they were all West Bank cities. Well, it depends. Actually, it's not something materialistic, of course. <laughs> Perhaps because the distance is very far away, I wouldn't agree. Okay. What about Nablus? Perhaps, maybe. That would work because I actually have some family uh, married in Ramallah. My sisters are married in Ramallah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you marry someone from Gaza? Mm, if he comes to live here, yes. Okay, you don't want to live in Gaza. Yes, I don't want to have this. I don't know. It's not. It's a problem. Yes. Yeah. Would you marry someone from Hebron? Uh, I love Ramallah. I love staying here, but I would marry him and. If go. he if he lived here. Yes. Then it's okay. Okay, even it's when what's the problem? Mentality. What's the problem? Different that? mentality. I mean, I'm talking about different. Okay, I think so. They have, but the person itself won't. I oh, will choose him that he won't have this thing. I don't know if he have the same mind as them. I won't. So what's the mentality in Gaza and Hebron? Give me an example. I didn't understand what the mentality. Keep keep it tough here in Gaza. Keep it different from them. I think in Arabic. Yes. 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 Yes.
They're more conservative. They have more old school thinking. Okay. Same in Gaza? Uh, no. No. In Gaza, I think we are modern, more modern, but the, the environment there is not suitable for living. Yeah, you know, it's hard. Yes. It's difficult. Yeah. Yes, yes, for sure. Okay. I'm from Hebron, actually. Oh, ah, okay. So, are you married to someone from Hebron? Are you married? Would you marry someone from Gaza? I would find it fine if, if me and the person uh, were getting along, but maybe my family wouldn't accept it so much. Why wouldn't your family accept it? Traditions and customs and also uh, moving from one place to another. Okay, but you see a difference in customs between Hebron and Gaza? I do believe so, yes. Can she give an example? I don't know. When it comes to marriage traditions, it's very different. How separated is Hebron from where these people live? Do they just never interact? I mean, they're not really that separated. Man, if I had to guess, Ramallah is probably like an hour away, if that. Um, directions to Hebron. Google Maps. I don't know. Let's check. I could be. Maybe I'm way off on that. Does, or I wonder if Google Maps won't connect because of gates or whatever. Three possible itineraries. Are these for buses? Maybe, I don't know. Well, probably like an hour drive away, I guess. So it says the quickest route is 56 minutes, so. So no, they're not really that far away. Iran is a, is a pretty huge city, though, for, I wonder if it's the largest in the West Bank. I never went into it, but looking at it from afar, I was like, holy shit. Hold on, I think I have pictures. One second. Oh, I could just Google pictures of it. I don't know why I'm... Is this? No, oh, that's some other place. It's not even a good picture. Fuck. I was curious how I would look through the archways, but I didn't like how this picture even ended up looking. I think I needed to frame the background more. Well, I got pictures of it. You can kind of see through the background. This is a huge fucking city. I don't know what the um, I don't know what the population of Hebron is. Um, Hebron population, 782,000. That's got to be the biggest city in the West Bank, right? The second largest city in the West Bank after East Jerusalem. Oh, okay, whatever. Basically, yeah. Probably the largest Arab population, because I bet a lot of Jews live in East Jerusalem now too, right? Give me that. How many Jews live in East Jerusalem versus Arabs? 2020, East Jerusalem had a population of 595,000 inhabitants, which 360,000 were Palestinian Arabs, and 234,000 were Jews. Okay, so almost 50-50. Not quite, 60-40. Okay. okay. Did you say I was gonna watch the debate tonight? I literally have it in my title. Do I not? Did I not put this in my title? debate tonight. I didn't have room for presidential debate. Okay. Hold on one sec.
This is the division. So, yes, it takes a long, long time because it means to change a culture which is embedded in these societies for who knows how many hundreds of thousands of years since we, human beings started to live in this region because they must live as a clan in order to save their source of water because this is a desert. Yeah, I think uh, the, I noticed as well the eight emirates you talk about are. Uh, they include Calcilia, they include Gaza, they include Arab Hebron. I think uh, controversially, in the eyes of the international community at least, it doesn't include uh, East Jerusalem. No. Is that non-negotiable for you, even if it were the difference between no. peace Jerusalem, and conflict? Jerusalem is fairly stable, uh, accessible to everyone, as it was never in the history. Never. Neither under the Jordanian occupation, illegal occupation of 19 is between 48 and 67, um, nor beforehand. So why, why shouldn't it continue to be as it is for 57 years already, since 1967? Wow, Edmund, thanks for the hard box. And uh, Israel proved that Jerusalem is a holy place for Jews, for Muslims, for Christians, is the best choice. Yeah, I can see why there's the attachment to places like uh, you know, the site of the Temple Mount and all that. But then, obviously, when Israel took East Jerusalem in 47, it expanded the municipality well, to include... East, East Jerusalem in 67. Yeah, is that, is that what I said? Yeah. Did I misspeak? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but then it also includes places that I don't feel like there is that same, like, um, was it the uh, uh, Shafat refugee camp or al Walaja? Is that... These villages who were annexed to Jerusalem because in 1967, because of the range of the 52 millimeter mortar. This was the reason. Mm. Means since we were afraid that we are again going to get the mortars from these places, we annexed them to Jerusalem in order to make sure that in any, in, in any, any solution which will be found with Jordan, without Jordan, will not be targeted by the Jordanians again. Look, the Jordanians, when they were in East Jerusalem, they were shooting at Western Jerusalem in order to kill Jews day and night. Uh, my aunt lived not far from the, from the eastern part of, uh, of Jerusalem. And in the, morn, in, the, in the morning, you couldn't open the windows to the east, to the old city. Why? Because the sun came from the east, so they could, the snipers, the Jordanian snipers who were standing or sitting on the on the city wall were shooting into the the windows to kill Jews in their homes. Only afternoon, when the sun is in their eyes, you could open the windows to the east. Are you willing to live in such a place? Any American would agree to live in such a situation when he cannot open the windows to one direction because the Mexicans are shooting into his windows? What will do America to, to, to Mexico if this, if this happened? But this is how we lived for 19 years. I don't know how common it was that people from East Jerusalem would shoot it. I don't know how, if that's true or not. I don't know how many data or stats for that. But And, and, and under this uh, illegal occupation of Jerusalem, which was by the Jordanians. And thank God we got rid of them. Yeah, it's interesting that you say the Jordanian occupation, you said it to Stephen as well, that the Jordanian occupation of uh, Jerusalem and West Bank as well, you say it was illegal. Well, 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 yeah, um, why was the Israeli occupation not illegal? Or was it to you? Because according to the San Remo decisions of the League of Nations, which are valid until this very day, according to chapter 80 of the Charter of the United Nations, the, all the space between the Jordan River and the, the Mediterranean Sea are designed for the Jewish people. San Remo decisions. This is the decision of the world, let alone the Bible. I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about the modern time legal basis of the existence of the state of Israel. This land was allocated, was given, was, was granted by the League of Nations to the Jewish people before, in 1920, before the Second World War, 
and was adopted by the United Nations in the chapter in the Charter, uh, Article Two uh, Eighty. Um, that just isn't true. Um, the legal, the early legal stuff, and what it, the actual implications were. Uh, I think there's like a little bit of interpretation that goes into like, like how exactly do who was granted what. Um, I, I don't think there was anything like too solid promised to any particular group of people. Um, I, not to sound like I'm simming for one side, but the strongest promise of anything in the mandatory Palestinian area would have been to the future state of Israel. There was never an explicit promise made for any kind of Palestinian state. So if you want to make a legal argument, it would probably rest on that. I think some people draw from San Remo. Some people draw just from the, um, there's a concept in international law about emerging states inheriting borders from prior things, but... Yeah. <clears throat> so this is why the Israel has all the rights to be on all the space. Because he seems more unhinged in his convo versus loner box or with loner box versus you for his justification about land. Well, because loner box is getting into more political questions, whereas I think mine were mainly kind of like historical. Um, his political stuff gets pretty. We get wackier. Thirty-five minutes left. Trust me. When we get to Europe, his political stuff starts to get pretty wacky. In the river and the sea. It is why today. Those who want to wipe Israel altogether, say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I say, okay, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free from any other occupation. It's okay. So you're telling me in San Remo, they said that there's a part in San Remo where they say that Israel is... San Remo, the, the entire thing? convention mm-hmm. of April of 1920. Unfortunately, the world doesn't know about this. But this is the legal basis of the existence of the state of Israel. Later came the mandate of 1923, which was... Why did you give Lonerbach so much time? Uh, Well, I think this guy said he wanted to chat for about two hours. Since I go first usually in our interviews, I tried to cut it off at about an hour because I didn't want to cut into Lonerbach's time. Um, But I guess he didn't mind chatting for longer than that. So I just didn't want to like chat for like two hours. And then he's like, oh, I don't want to talk to this guy now. I'm trying to be polite. Uh, Britain got this area. France got the northern, Syria and Lebanon to establish states within 25 years based on mass migration of Jews to this country. This was the the mandate charter. Britain betrayed us by the white paper. And without this British betrayal, millions of Jews could be saved from the Holocaust because many of the Jews could come to this country under the mandate if Britain allowed them. And Hitler, when he saw that no country except uh, he wanted Europe to be Judenrein, means without any Jews, clean of Jews, as if Jews are filthy, clean of Jews. And he sent, well, there was a ship named St. Louis, which took to carry 900 Jews from Hamburg went to Cuba, they didn't allow her to dock. They went to the United States, they didn't allow her. They went to Canada, to Halifax, in Nova Scotia. And the Canadian Minister of Migration said, none is too many of these 900. So they returned to Hamburg, and they were uh, sent to extermination. So when the the, uh, the Hitler saw that no country, Britain, made a whole blockade on the on this country, on Palestine, Eretz Israel, Palestine, the, the land of Israel, as the name was of the mandate was. And they didn't allow Jews to come. And neither of those countries never, never allowed Jews. Do you think it's a tenable position to forever deny Palestinians a state or citizenship? Nope. Jews to come. So we exterminated them in 1941, started this final solution. If Britain, no, the, the United States didn't have any commitment. Cuba didn't have any commitment. Canada didn't have commitment, but Britain did have a commitment by the, by, by the mandate to allow mass migration of Jews to their homeland. And they betrayed us. And somehow the British succeeded to sneak out from the inf- infamous list of nations which cooperated with Hitler. They are responsible. I'm not trying to reduce the responsibility of Hitler for the Holocaust. Six million Jews were were exterminated. But without the British 
How did the British betray the Jews? So initially, Britain promised um, through the Balfour Declaration to create um, a, a homeland for the Jews in, in Palestine. And so Jewish people were like, oh, cool, we've got a place to go where we can be free of persecution. Uh, however, in after there was a... Uh, was Peel the prime minister? Oh, fuck, I remember. Peel, there was something called the Peel Commission, the white paper. Um, Great Britain did a big investigation in 1936 to figure out, well, what the fuck is going on in this area that the Arabs and the Jews keep fighting with each other. We don't know why they're not getting along. And in 37, there was a white paper that was published called the Peel Commission. They basically said, okay, listen, um, we think there probably needs to be two states here because these guys aren't getting along. It was the first time that was recommended. Uh, in response to that, the Arabs... Uh, had a huge revolt in the area. They were like, fuck this. This is bullshit. They're not having any fucking state here. Okay, you're not splitting us up. This is our land. Fuck you. Um, the Brits put down that rebellion. But afterwards, the Brits turned to the Jews and they were like, listen, you guys are causing way too much trouble here. So we are now going to heavily restrict your ability to immigrate to this region. And so for about five years after 39, Jewish people fought with the British government because they're like, wait, what the fuck? This is bullshit. And then for, for the years that I said, from 39 to, to 44, right, during the Holocaust, um, a lot of Jews think, or they would claim, well, no, I mean, it's probably true. A lot of Jews would say, like, hey, we should be able to just go to Palestine. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Like, the Jewish homeland that you guys promised us in 1917, you committed to having a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. Can't we, like, go there now? This would be a really good time for us to do that because we're kind of being killed by the millions. Wouldn't that be awesome? And I was like, well, nope, sorry. Uh, we are restricting immigration to, I think it was 10,000 a year or maybe less, but we're heavily restricting immigration. I'm allowed to. So some Jews, uh, if they're cognizant of this history, um, will will say that, like, you guys are— you, you fucked us really hard that millions of us were holocausted and we could have just went to Palestine, but because you gave in to uh, Arab violence uh, in the late 30s, you basically enabled them to block us from coming here. And so now half our population died. Thanks a lot, basically. So they would blame Britain for that. Okay. On this country, the Holocaust was not in such a magnitude as it was. Yeah, well, I'm Scottish, so I have no problem blaming British people for things. Um, no, they betrayed us because of their accounts with the Arabs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I'd, so do you, because um, I imagine with your, what you said about San Remo guaranteeing all of the river to the sea to Israel, I feel like there are Israeli historians, I think especially Bernard Wasserstein, who would disagree with especially. that, no? Is it Wasserstein? The guy who writes about um, mandate for years. I, think, I feel like there's a bit of a disagreement about whether or not it was actually allocated to all of uh, Israel, the river to the sea, because I think there's clarifications from Balfour a bit later on where they say that it's always understood that the declaration was to do with part of Palestine, not well, all of I it. I know about, about documents. Mm -hmm. Read the document and, and, and see, see for yourself what, what it says. Yeah, I'll get back to you on it. Okay. okay. Um, moving away from Middle East, uh, I don't think I was unable to find you talking that much about. Uh, Islam in... By the way, Islam hmm? um, Zionist leaders uh, Chaim Weizmann and David Ben-Gurion of the Jewish Agency were both firmly opposed to Jews being allowed into Western, uh, being allowed entry into Western countries, hoping that the pressure of hundreds of thousands of refugees having nowhere to go would force Britain to open Palestine to Jewish immigration. Is this true or is this super biased framing? It might be true. If you're reading anything on Wikipedia, I would be very, very careful. Wikipedia tends to slant very heavily pro-Palestinian because a lot of the most active editors on there, like, will will fight to the death to edit things in the most biased, like, pro-Palestinian way possible. So if you ever see something like that written on Wikipedia, just, like, hunt down the sources and try to read, like, where the quotes come from so that you can get an idea of... Um, you can get an idea of, of what the sourcing is. Also, um, and I emphasize this when I debated that one PhD guy a while ago, timelines are essential when you're talking about this era. Um, saying that somebody was opposed to Jews immigrating West in 1939 is significantly different than them saying they're opposed to Jews immigrating West three years later. The huge differences. So the timelines and the dates published are essential, okay? Um, people will sometimes, uh, th again, this happened in that 
with that one PhD guy, I feel like there's another debate where this happened. The timelines and the dates are very important on this because the circumstances of the world and what people were aware of were significantly different. The idea of somebody saying like, oh, um, I don't think we want Jews to go to the West. We should like not let that happen so they can come here to Palestine. That's different before people know that the Holocaust is happening. Okay, that's way different, um, which I believe was in 41, late 41, early 42, I think is when that started to become more publicized. So just be very, 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 very aware of timelines on that. That's very important. Um, <clears throat> yeah. When did the world find out about Holocaust? Let me check. Uh, I thought the fir I think the first time I thought it was in late forty one, and then it started to come out around forty two. Well, when did the world find out about the Holocaust? Let's ask the Jewish Virtual Library. Information regarding mass murder of Jews began to reach the free world soon after the actions began in the Soviet Union in late June 1941. And the volumes of such reports increased with time. The early system information include German police reports, intercepted by British intelligence. As early as March 42, reports from Nazi planned to murder all the Jews, including details and methods. Uh, First media reference to murder Jews in the Polish Home Army publication, Buell, you know, I don't care, 1942. When was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Wikipedia. It was in 1943. In 42, Jews were shipped to ghetto. Okay, so maybe it's like 42, 43. Um, regardless, my point stands. Um, make sure that you the, the the dates are very 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 important. <laughs> is essentially what I'm yeah trying to get at. You should interview a lawyer named Jabotier. Mm -hmm. He lives in Toronto. Get to him. He will explain to you in better English than mine. Okay. Uh, he actually has the original copy of the San Remo decision. Uh, Jacques Gauthier. Uh, look, at, look for the man. Yeah, I, I read San Remo once. I guess the problem was I just found it very, it's like there's a lot of ambiguity, right? That's why there was confusion about what happens to Jordan afterwards, because it's not really mentioned in San Remo, but the British thought it included it because of Sykes-Picot. But yeah, I'll take your word for it. So um, coming to Europe, uh, I haven't seen you write that much about uh, Muslims and Islam in Europe, but I think uh, you did at one point join, uh, I think you were was it an assistant director or a, an advisor to an organization called uh, Stop Islamization of Nations, 2012, well, 13? It was like 15 years ago. Yeah, what did you, uh, oh. what was your role in that organization? Are you still with them? Well, or just uh, one of the members of uh, many people who joined the, the organization ran by Pamela Geller mm -hmm. in New York. And uh, look, l l if you zoom out uh, to see what happens today in the world, especially in Europe, is that this migration jihad, and this is another kind of jihad. Jihad, if, I don't know if you know, but jihad has all kinds of facets, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of manifestations. There is the jihad by sword, which is the fighting jihad. There's the economic jihad the BDS movement, uh, boycott and divestment from Israel. I'm not aware in Islam where there are different types of jihad like specified. I don't know if this is in any of the hadiths or not. I've never heard of this before. I think in general, I think the understanding is just that jihad is just anytime you're engaged in a fight for Islam against a non-Muslim, against an infidel, I think. But I, I guess theoretically it could extend to that. Uh, it can refer to almost any exertion or effort or of effort to make personal and social life conform with God's guidance, such as internal struggle against one's evil inclinations, proselytizing, or efforts towards the betterment of the Muslim community, the Ummah. So I guess it theoretically could be then. I don't know like if it's specifically mentioned in any writing or whatever, but there is media jihad. Al Jazeera defines itself. I mean it's Karadawi defined define Al Jazeera as media jihad. Okay? There is uh, arson jihad. If you burn a church, if you burn a synagogue, if you burn something which belongs to the infidels. Actually, jihad is whatever a Muslim is doing as a person or as a community in order to enhance 
the cause of Islam on the expense of the infidels. This oh, is the idea Islam. of jihad. It could be by sword, it could be by many other, many other ways. Migration is one of them. Birth jihad is bring kids to the world. What happens today in Europe is... Somebody said, jihad is very often used in the Quran, and I believe less than half the time is referring to actual wars or conflict with other people. Uh, the Ben-Gurion quote retards like to trot out is, if I knew that it was possible to save all the Jewish children in Germany by transporting them to England, but only, but only half by transporting them to Palestine, I would choose the second. Okay. It is from the 30s. Well, wait, wait, what do you mean it's from the 30s? What would he be saving them from? Both. Migration jihad and birth jihad. If you combine both together, you see that this new jihad, new kind, peaceful kind of jihad, are actually flooding Europe. What you see in Sweden, in Mali especially, but in other places as well. What you see in France, what you see in Britain, what you see in Spain, Belgium. You know, there are already many towns, cities, with an Islamic majority. Jews were persecuted uh, before the official Holocaust start date in Germany. Sure, the Holocaust was the death camps. Before that was the concentration camps. When did, when were the major... I thought this was like mid to late 30s for... I don't actually know when the concentration camps started. Concentration camps for Jews. Wikipedia. From 33 to 45. So when did he make that quote? Was it in like, was it in like 39 or 38 or... I don't know. Death camp started in 41. What does it mean? And the birth rate, you think, eh, is more than double than the European one. What will be the next generation? It's mathematics, it's not even statistics. You can very easily calculate. If, if you stop the migration, only birth rate will bring them to majority within 30 years, 40 years, depends where. When the, when the birth rate of Europeans is somewhere between one and two children per woman, closer to one than to two, while the migrants have four, five, thanks to the benefits which they get wherever they are. Why not? When the, the demand of kinds of things, and you can see the demanding or only increasing uh, to have halal food, to not to allow kids in the school to come with pork sandwiches. To that degree, because they don't want to smell it. To that degree. Not only what they eat, what the others eat. They don't like bells of churches. They don't like contraceptives sold in pharmacies. They don't like alcoholic beverages. And they... How would you argue against this argument? I, I think, as I said before, I don't think there is as much of a cohesive uh, feeling of like jihad or um, of jihad or of um, like Islam as, as I think he would think. This is like an intuition I have, and it doesn't really push me one way or another, but I'm curious the data is. It, it wouldn't surprise me if for, it wouldn't surprise me if, I don't know, there's like a poll or some data you go look up. It wouldn't surprise me if in Europe, First generation Muslims produced more radical second or third generation Muslims. Or that like, or rather, if you looked at your most radical, like second or third generation Muslims, my guess is they probably came from not as radical first generation immigrants. Like they're more radical. That'd be my guess. I, th I feel like um, <clears throat> from, a, from a over the ocean view, uh, it feels like people that resort to kind of like the more Islamic extremist or fundamentalist or whatever shit in Europe usually do so out of like desperation or they feel like they're not integrating in society or for whatever bullshit. Like it's more that more than like, a, yes, we've made it to the European lands. Let us begin our, let us begin our, uh, our reproductive jihad. Would be my, be my guess. In some places where they have the majority, the, you cannot anymore find alcoholic beverages in the supermarkets because the city hall is by majority of Muslims. This happens already. Um, so oh, it is an encroachment of, of demands. In Destiny, that's not what the science shows. Second and third generation Muslims were the ones joining ISIS, while their parents were quite secular who fled there. I... Okay. No, 
in France, in many places, you have to keep every night the shift of, let's say, X-ray uh, uh, technicians, a man and a woman. Although both are, don't have anything to do during the night, but you have to keep both. Why? Because if a man comes, like let's say a road accident, and he needs an X-ray, if a man, a man will take his X-ray. If Lonerbach said this is an internal European problem and doesn't have as much to do with Islam as just disaffected young men. Um, yeah, kind of, but the, the issue is that I think Islam is scary and dangerous because it gives you, there's, two, there's just a lot of real world application to it. Um, Judaism and Christianity don't really, don't feel like they have as much real world application. I guess for Christians, it's like fucking abortion or whatever, and maybe put, sticking Ten Commandments in, um, in fucking courthouses. But Islam just has so much real world implication for a government and how to act aggressively towards others. It would be scary to see somebody turn to that in desperation uh, rather than like another type of, you know, religion. I think that Islam might unlock a little bit more there. But not like as some unified invading power, more just as like, well, if this is what you gravitate towards, it could it could produce um, it could produce worse outcomes. Maybe I'm not like I don't feel strong about that. But that's like a I give you a twenty percent conviction on that. Do you think the reason American Muslims are more chill is because it's harder to immigrate here? Um, I think that's part of it, but I also feel like in America, because we don't have a strong shared ethnicity, I think it's easier for us to integrate other types of people into this country. Um, the United States, uh, is for as much as Nazis might want to argue opposite, um, is very much like a, a melting pot of different ethnic groups. I think it's easier to take in other ethnic groups and, and have them integrated into this culture. Whereas even in Western Europe, even in Scandinavia, like the ethnic lines <clears throat> tie in more than in America to, to their nationality lines, which probably makes it a bit harder um, for integration of foreign people. And then there's also the selection filter. You get a lot of different types of people immigrating that can just go by land rather than having to take a plane ticket or be referred by the UNHC or whatever as well. So. If a woman comes, a woman will take it because they don't allow or they don't like men to take the exile of, of, of a woman and vice versa. Who can afford it? So you have to double the budget of the exile division and other divisions as well, let alone all kinds of other diseases which they never allow men to treat women and vice versa. So this is demands which come more and more and more to... Destiny, Islam is uniquely unable to reform ever due to ideas like religious innovation, um, the Quran being exactly transmitted from Allah versus Christians, being able to say, LOL, Paul is being Paul in this part, just ignore this. Um, I, 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 you could do it. I, you can do it with any fucking religion. I don't even feel like there's that big of a difference uh, between how the, the Quran was written versus the Bible, but maybe, I don't know, maybe they just teach it to Catholics different. Um, in uh, in Islam, uh, the uh, the Torah, or not the Torah, I'm sorry, the Quran, like supposedly comes straight from uh, straight from Allah to Muhammad, who supposedly can't even read or write, and then basically writes it down. Um, I, I think like through that like brain transmission process. Uh, but for uh, biblical scripture that was written by, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the gospel writers, Paul, whatever, whoever the fuck, that was supposed to be divinely inspired. Like, it's supposed to be like you're writing under the divine inspiration of God in being correct when you write these things. It's not just people writing stories. They're writing with divine inspiration. I feel like it's not that big of a difference between divine inspiration and, like, the direct, like, you know, 11, 10 a.m. transmission from God, but I don't know. If Christians can, or if Catholics can have, like, um, you know, councils to vote on, you know, which Bible verses they believe in and which Bible verses they don't or which books they want to include in canon or which books they don't. Or if, um, or if like Muslims can divide among Sunni and, and Shia sects, if some can believe, you know, in the strength of the validity of some hadiths over others, if some think that, you know, for Shias that Muhammad named his, uh, his uh, um, children. Uh, fuck, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, versus in Sunni, they think it wasn't named. They don't know who it was. Um, I, I, there, I mean, there's a way to do it. There's always a way to do it. The fact that, like, the fact that Muslims live in America and they're relatively chill, the fact that Muslims live in Israel and they're relatively chill, I think proves that as much as anything else, I would say. But... ...the European countries, and you can actually re read a magnificent book 
read, uh, written by Douglas Murray, The Strange Death of Europe. Uh -oh. It is in English. And you know, this is what happens in Europe. And believe me, the Atlantic Ocean is not wide enough to keep America away from this danger. And when you see, you see today what happens in the American campuses, you, you find Europe like 10 years ago. This is how it started in Europe, in the campuses, which are open, which are liberal, which are inviting, which are including, including, you know, everybody, let them come, it's okay. Okay, in Europe they have the remorse on colonialism, which they uh, bought migrants from the third world countries after the colonialism. America is not, doesn't suffer from this uh, uh, remorse about what they did to the occupied uh, people in, 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 in Africa, for example, because the Americans were not colonialists. They were colonized. But uh, uh, in America you have other problems of the woke, which today controls everything in America. And um, everybody is entitled to his story. And, everybody, uh, and look, they, uh, they, they were actually caught. There is a document named the Explanatory Memorandum of the Muslim Brotherhood. It was found in the 90s. It was authored in May 91. 90 there is some difference between divinely inspired and God directly speaking through someone. In the New Testament, the four Gospels aren't consistent because humans err, but the Quran is literally God speaking through the prophet. I have never in all of my Catholic life ever heard somebody imply that there are errors in any of the four Gospels. Uh, that might be something maybe that was taught in some other Catholic places that I missed or whatever, but I've never, ever heard that before. The way that I've generally heard it explained is that John, so John is the more kind of like poetic of the writers, and then the other three uh, might differ in some very small details that are not very relevant, but like holistically, like they're just giving slightly different perspectives on essentially the same story um, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And then there's, you've got biblical scholarship with a Q source and all that bullshit, but uh, most people don't give a fuck about that. But I've never in my life heard it implied that, um, oh, well, some of the writers might have been incorrect when they uh, wrote down stuff divinely inspired by God. I've, I've never heard that before. Maybe, maybe they do teach that, or maybe we didn't learn that in my school, or maybe I learned it and I forgot, but I've never heard that before. 1991 means 33 years ago. It was found in the investigation of the Holy Land Foundation. That's the main Islamic claim about the other Abrahamic religions. He's saying that they're much more unlikely to change it uh, because it's the primary selling point of Islam, being the unfiltered, unchanging truth of Allah, while the other religions have changed over time. Okay, but they can't even agree on, on if Muhammad named descendants or not. I mean, they literally have like huge different like sectarian divide in Islam, which is supposed to be an unchanging, ultimately unifying religion. <laughs> I mean, in the in the Muslim world, what do you, what do you want me to say? I mean, Jesus. A, a, a group which supported Hamas and was taken to court, and they found, the the American investigation uh, authorities found this document in Arabic. And there is, in the internet, you can download it for free, um, a, a official translation made by the Department of Justice. So it's a 32-page document, 16 in Arabic, 16 in English, and English is the translation. And they tell you without any, you know, and even try to, they don't even try to, to hide. They came to America in order to establish themselves in America, in order to Islamize America. And <laughs> read the document. And it's an official document. It's not something which uh, somebody else authored. The, the author is known, and the document is known, is known and now it is on, on, on the net. Read, it's in clear English, the second part, because this is the translation, official translation. How they come to America in order to bring Islam to America not as an option, but to Islamize America. And there are many evidence to this. Okay, you, you, you can sleep on God and uh, behave like the Europeans. Um, so I live in the UK. I think uh, to an extent, I think it's people do kid Can you walk today in East London yeah. and feel at home? Yeah. In Luton? Yeah, I go to White Chapel Can you walk in Luton? Luton? In Luton and feel at home? Luton. Luton? I get from the airport. It's not too bad. No, me. not from the airport. The town itself. No, I've never been to Luton. I've been to... I to advise you, you. Take a camera and uh, try to go in there. They will not let you take pictures. 
Well, I guess the question is, is that especially, I think it was uh, Robert Spencer was the other guy that was in that org that you were part of. And um, he's banned. Yeah. In, in, in the UK, because the UK doesn't want to listen so, to those who... who uh, can't get this guy on Twitter. Uh, try to, to wake them up. Look, Melanie Phillips wrote this magnificent book, Don Londonistan, How Britain Becomes a Terror State from Within. This is the subtitle. She wrote it in 2005. She was a prophet, because today you see exactly what happens in the UK. Because the UK allowed, look what happened in Birmingham, look this gang of rape of girls, which was not allowed to be even uh, reported in the, in, in the papers. What is this? Okay, low birth rate, you need more workers for everything. And look at who is today is selling in the, in the department stores. Look, look who are the drivers, who are the workers in the industry. Look how uh, the British, like other Europeans, want to be lawyers, accountants, media people, politicians, and high tech. That's all. Everything else is being taken by migrants. Yeah, well, when, I, uh, when it comes to the UK, I do think... People are kidding themselves when they say that there's no tension at all when you bring uh, different cultures into your country, especially in like fairly reasonable numbers. Um, but I think the other side of it is especially um, like Spencer and those people that you mentioned, is that I feel like that problem goes both ways because I think what happens in Europe, most when it comes to radicalization and uh, terror attacks, it's, al it's almost always second generation. It's not the first generation. And it feels like on one end. So what do you have. want? To prevent the second generation? No, well what I want is that it seems to be that part of that radicalization process is a feeling that you're not at home when you're in that country because some of those people you mentioned, Spencer, one of the reasons he wasn't allowed to speak in the UK was because he was invited by the EDL, the English Defence League, like a group of right-wing thugs who are very famous for having rallies where they get drunk and go and fight people and riot and like they've caused like million pounds of damage in different places. Let me ask you so. something very, very clearly. Uh -oh. Let's say that all the Muslims which are brought to Britain are peaceful, nice people. They do nothing against even a mosquito on the wall. Okay? When the birth rate of the Brits is 1.4, if, if I'm not mistaken, per woman, and their birth rate is above four, what will be in three generations? And I, I'm leaving every, I, I don't talk about terrorism at all. I'm talking about how will the British nation look like in four generations from today? Yeah, it's assuming that the migration rate stays the same for four generations. Like, you could have said the same about Italians no, you can calculate in America it. coming from You can years, calculate right? it very easily. It's mathematics, it's not even statistics. You can calculate it. No shot, their birth rate is about four. I haven't even looked it up. That, it would surprise me if they're, can you find that? Muslim birth rate, UK. I'm seeing 3.4 and 3, which is still pretty high. 2.9. Anywhere from 2.9 to 3.4? I don't know. I also don't know how much those uh, birth rates would hold true for second, third, fourth generation immigrants as well, because after people integrate, it tends to change. But I don't know what the integration looks like for these people as well in Europe. So, You know how many Muslims there are today. You can calculate if they have, you know, the, the birth rate which they have. Against this, you, you put the British, and you can see exactly. The British are going down, these are going up, and in four generations, the, there will be museums of blonde people. So, I feel like in, uh, when you... The, not the blonde people museums. You speaking about the Middle East, it seems like you, um, you took a real, very profound interest in learning Arabic and learning the cultures, but uh, some of these people that you mentioned, like, uh, especially Spencer and um, maybe to an extent Melanie Phillips, but a bit less, um, is that these are people who were, like, quoted... They don't seem to have the same interest in actually learning the culture that you do. It just seems like from them I get, like... Uh, polemicists, people who describe uh, immigration as like a 1,400-year war happening between Islam and Europe, or they'll talk about, um, they'll describe immigration as an invasion. And I guess the result is, is that 
you get the threat coming both ways, is you get far-right groups all over Europe that are very aggressive towards uh, local Muslims, even when they're not doing anything. And you get, like, I think Spencer in particular, he was quoted about 64 times in the manifesto of Anders Breivik. So, uh, Look, Robert Spencer, first of all, he, he is from a family which came from the Middle East. I think from Lebanon. A Christian family who ran away from Lebanon. Start with this. Second thing, he quotes um, sources. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure he, he speaks Arabic, but I think he reads Arabic. There's a difference between speaking and reading. Uh, Pamela Gela, I don't know, but uh, Spencer definitely has his point. And to shove him under the rug because you don't like to hear what he has to, to say is no way to deal with the problem. Well, I, if people having problematic opinions is maybe not the issue, but if someone who speaks in such an inflammatory way that they are what, seen as an inspiration his, to... His choice of words is not appropriate. Uh, rhetoric matters, I think, doesn't it? Rhetoric. This is the problem. I think so. Is this a, part of the problem, isn't it? Sir, what, where is the problem? The style which Spencer talks or what happens in the British streets? Where is the problem? Well, I think you can talk. This is, so if you want to be combative here, the way that somebody speaks is incredibly important. Uh, and it's funny, if we center it on the Arab world, especially in the Arab world, right? The brinksmanship that would happen between, um, b between Arab leaders, uh, uh, I mean, like drove wars, arguably. But um, even more than that, Uh, here's like another, just another point about the importance of words, kind of. Um, what am I looking for? Research, Kindle. Ooh. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that the author of that, the Conflict of Culture Middle East book, okay, he talks about um, how two different parties would like the process of like resolving um, an affront from one to the other or um, and then also like recounting uh, how conflicts would play out it's just the process is, is just kind of funny but hold on which it kind of plays into this concept of like how you explain something or just the word you use might mean a little bit Um, did I, wait, did I highlight this? Yeah, right, listen, that's why I find this. Hold on. Talk about what's happening in the British streets without using the kind of descriptions okay. and exaggerations. Okay, if he spoke that... uh, nicely, with good words, with nice and flattering expressions, but he will tell you the same thing. Would you allow him to speak in Britain? Um, no. Well, because it feels like, well, I would allow people to speak in Britain. I don't have a problem look, with that. Uh, this is one of the problems of the woke culture. All right. Did uh -oh. you look at how people say things other than what they say. You look at the, at the framework other than the picture itself. Because you don't like the picture, you talk about the, the framework. Sir, look at the essence of the issues. Leave the language. Language could be nice, language could be less nice. I'm not sure that uh, people like what I say because of the style of my talking. I, as an academic, I look for the truth of the issues. I don't 
agree with this surrender of the academic institutions of today to the discourse of a narrative. You know what the narrative is? Mm -hmm. Narrative is something which was invented recently in order to elevate the lie to the degree of narrative. Okay, sorry, hold on. I'm just going to read you this section, okay? This might take a few minutes, okay? It's interesting. It illustrates some of the things I've been talking about for this as well, okay? Um, the title of the section is Where Honor Lies. Among Arabs, all men are in principle equal, or more precisely, not unequal by any prescribed ascription. That is, all men are born equal without higher or lower rank. It is in this sense that we can say that Arab culture is decisively egalitarian. Each man, being in principle equal to all others, is also in principle autonomous, making decisions for himself according to his own lights. Each man, free to act as he chooses, is thus responsible for his own actions. In this sense, we can say that Arab culture decisively encourages freedom of the individual. Honor is deemed to reside with those who are able to maintain their equality, independence, and freedom. This is true for both individuals and groups. Subordination of any kind results in a loss of honor and a sense of shame. Subordination is regarded as a loss of manhood, as manhood and manly virtues, assertiveness, strength, courage, tenacity, endurance, and capability are equated with honor. As the Arabic proverb puts it, quote, he who rules over you emasculates you, end quote. Similarly, in any confrontation, conflict, or combat, uh, honor comes with victory and shame comes with defeat. Victory validates manhood and honor, while defeat is symbolic castration and shames the defeated. In the Middle East, in confrontations great and small, there is no virtue in being a victim. There is only the triumph of the victor and the disgrace of the conquered. Domination gives honor, submission gives shame. Thus, there are, in principle, multiple and ongoing challenges to equality, autonomy, and freedom. Each confrontation, conflict, or combat generates honored victors and shamed losers. This results in different men and groups having differential degrees of honor and shame, and, in ranking these, an achieved hierarchy of honor. Men and their groups may achieve the highest level of independence and the honor that goes with it, but they must assert their claims to struggle for rank. An Arab proverb puts it this way, quote, Always be sure to claim all due respect for what you have and deserve, end quote. The combination of ascribed equality and achieved hierarchy is what Alexei de Tocqueville found in American democracy. No ascribed status at birth, which resulted in a fierce status competition and a hierarchy of success. Honor for Arabs and other Middle Easterners is a constant concern and worry, as it is easily challenged and lost. But at the same time, honor can be increased by timely and effective action, by assertion and courage. In this way, the quest for honor encourages or leads to offensive action, initiatives by individuals or groups against others for the rewards of honor. Thus, relations between individuals and between groups are shaped by the competition for honor. There is no, this is no less true for settled and urbanized Arabs as it is for nomadic Bedouin in the, des in the desert, no less true for farmers, drivers, wholesalers, and craftsmen as it is for camel herders. So it was during the 30 years from 1960 to 1990 between the uh, Barabha, um, Shalalfa, uh, Shalalf, and Trabalsia, uh, patrilineal kin groups in the Israeli towns uh, in the Israeli town of Ramla, 18 kilometers southeast of Tel Aviv. I draw here at some length. Um, from Gideon M. Kressel's Ascendancy Through Aggression, the autonomy, or I'm sorry, the anatomy of a blood feud among urbanized Bedouin in 1996. Okay, like two pages of this, okay? This is, the way that this is resolved is, is interesting, I think. Um, <clears throat> These patri uh, patrilineages um, with Bedouin origins were part of the Arab population of 3,800 among 30,000 Jews in the town. The members of these lineages, some of whom had lived in the town for decades, had modern occupations in mechanized agriculture, transport, and wholesale commerce. But these lineages tended to live fairly compactly located in or around the Bedouin quarter and in public housing provided for them. As well, and more importantly, they maintained their um, asabiya their lineage solidarity, and each maintained at least one sheik, a meeting house for members of the lineage. This result is not unusual for, as Kressel explains, molding a social landscape of petrolineage quarters is the traditional pattern by which urban society in the Middle East has always been structured. The feud between the lineages began with a small matter, as they often do. An amount of money owed by a shalalfa uh, to a, bar a barabha led um, when they happened to meet to an exchange of unpleasantries, and the Barabha, some of whom, uh, some of whose women folk were present, took this as a grave insult, not just to the individual, but to the lineage as a whole. 
Uh, here we see in action the principle of each member standing for all members and for the group as a whole. An insult to one becomes an insult to all. This exchange became a talking point throughout the two lineages and among the neutral lineages that made up the observing public. Collective responsibility means that everyone in a lineage is involved in a conflict affecting one of them, as Kressel describes the Arab rule. Each agnet, male kinsman, is theoretically responsible for, uh, for avenging injuries to property, life, and honor, leading back five generations, i.e. to his paternal grandfather's grandfather. What this means, in fact, is that each agnet is committed to preserving the honor of all living descendants of his paternal great-great-great-grandfather. Should any agnet be injured or insulted, it is the collective responsibility of all the others to take revenge, and in the event that any agnet injures or harms a member of another lineage, he, puts, uh, he put all of his own kamsa, five, i.e. kin group descended five generations at risk. Okay, comes was that word I was trying to think of. <clears throat> the avoidance or abdication or even undue postponement of this responsibility would lead to loss of honor for the group and its members and bring severe internal criticism upon those not acting. Then, several days later, the young Shalalfa, um, Shal Shalalfa, that is unpronounced. The young Shalalfa man who had spoken the insult was ambushed by a number of Barabha youths in the olive grove as he drove his tractor back from work. Uh, they had lain in wait for him, stopped him, demanded payment, hit him, and threatened his life. The Shalalfa went to the highest ranked lineage, uh, the tribal. Uh, the tribal Sia, to complain about their injury and hoping to find support for receiving compensation. Uh, sometimes what they'll do is they find people who are equidistant from them in terms of family to have them resolve a dispute between the other two families that are feuding. But they, the, they should be equal distant from the families. So for instance, I wouldn't go to my, I wouldn't go to my, um, my first cousins and ask them to resolve a disagreement that I'm having between my fourth or fifth cousins. We would both go to mutual third cousins to have them resolve a disagreement, if that makes sense. Because you don't want them to be um, biased in terms of how they would resolve the dispute. So equidistance is, is relatively important, I think, for these, although that might not always be the case. Um, <clears throat> Nor were the, okay, the Barabha, for their part, claimed that the exchanges were now even and no one was owed anything. Nor were the Barabha delighted at Trabalsia at, uh, Trabalsia intervention and were perhaps growing tired of being subordinate in ranking to the leading, to the leading Trabalsia. Four months later, with angry feelings still simmering in the two lineages, the conflict broke out again. Two of the Barabha drank too much and drove to the Shalalfa houses, where they smashed into one of the Shalalfa cars. The Shalalfa men came out and asked them to stop their attack and go away. The Shalalfa and Barabha men started fighting. The Shalalfa man, who had originally passed the insult, was stabbed twice in the head and in the back of the neck and taken to the hospital nearly dead. One of the drunk Barabha was knocked on the head with a log by the mother of the stabbed man. With the advent of serious fighting and major injuries, members of lineages gathered in the Sheik meeting rooms along with members of allied smaller lineages to exhibit solidarity. At the same time, Israeli police intervention was initiated with the goal of stopping the conflict and reinstituting order. The strategy of the police was to add its weight to the traditional Bedouin mediation process, which involves first a preliminary ceasefire agreement called a Wujeh, uh, literally meaning face, after the Bedouin notables who agreed to act as guarantors of the peace, during which mediators try to work out a formal truce, or an atwa, literally gift, the restraint of the injured party, which, with further mediation and negotiation, would lead to a formal reconciliation, sol. The reports and presentations of the events by the interested parties also develop through phases. Um, first, okay, so this is, this is the part that made me think of like how you phrase something, it's just a funny, we read together here, fuck it, suck my dick, okay. First, each side in the fight stresses their own great prowess and the severe injuries that they visited on their opponents. Each side also denies that they themselves suffered any serious injuries. In this phase, each side is trying to bolster its honor by claiming superior strength and denying injuries. Even if there is an evident winner and loser, and the judge of this is the public, the other lineages, the losing lineage tries to minimize its loss, just as the winner tries to maximize its victory. The second phase begins with the informal public verdict of victor and vanquished. Then, with mediation and compensation, looming, the winner asserts its innocence in the conflict and minimizes the injuries it has caused. The victim now exaggerates its injuries and losses in order to gain maximum compensation. But of the result for the allocation of honor, for public standing, and for the ranking of the lineages, there is no doubt. He who gives compensation is ruled the victor. He who receives compensation is deemed the loser. The victor gains honor. The vanquished loses honor. The victor ranks higher in the hierarchy of honor than the loser. Um, and then it goes on for how this period continued, but I just thought that process was interesting. Who joined? What do you want? Hi. Oh, hi. What's up? Fucking, I'm sorry. 
This fucking conversation, like this part of it with Mr. Kadar, am I kind of, am I being insane or is it just, it feels like I would start a sentence and he would just grab one word from that sentence and then just go on his own fucking riff with it. Like, and I don't really know if I should have just like kept talking until he stopped or just like, because like just accept that I'm in his house and there's like, the least I can do is just let him talk and then I've got the content there of him just saying things. I don't know. This really fucked with me this far. Is it, we're doing interviews here, right? So they're answering like in interview ways. Like these aren't like debates. So it's not like you've had the obligation to recenter it or cut him off. I mean, like we're just, we're just doing interviews, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah. Cause like basically fucking everything he's saying here is wrong. Like, sure. And I mean like he's, um, he's trying to orient the answers also in a particular direction as well. Like that's pretty clear that he's trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw you were asking the Muslim birth rate. It's been dropping like, I think it was three, about 20 years ago in the UK. And it's been dropping ever since. It's kind of like predicted. And it's dropping around the entire world. Because obviously, if you're in the UK, it's like fucking uh, education of women. Yeah, and as you industrialize like, more and more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, someone said that you <laughs> had a gap in the, the Holocaust uh, timeline. Something about Ben-Gurion's quote, the... Uh, no, I just if said I somebody brought up like um, somebody just brought up like quotes from like, oh, well, what about when he talked about the saving blah, blah, blah. All I told people was that if you are getting quotes from people, if you're too lazy to go and look at the context of the quote and, the, and like where it was delivered and what it was going on at that time, at the very least know that the timelines are very, very, very important. Um, I would out of hand disregard completely the opinion of somebody giving me a quote who's not giving me a date attached to it, especially in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, because a few mm -hmm. years could meaningfully change dramatically like the, the meaning of that particular quote, and it would either go from absolutely fucking horrible to uh, not that bad at all to incredibly understandable. So I think timelines are really important quotes like that. That's basically what you were talking about. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, because the Ben Gurion quote, I think you were asking, though, like, if I could save half the Jews and bring them to Israel versus rescue all of them and bring them to well, and put them in England, I would do the Israel but, one. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he says that it's Israel. But, well, um, yeah, he said that in uh, December 1938. It's a month after Kristallnacht, he said that. Mm -hmm. And he specified uh, Jewish children of Germany. So sure. yeah, he was very much viewing, like, Kristallnacht onwards. Um, Sure, but was Chris, is Crystal knock that? Zionism. Is that was that that exceptional? Yeah, I mean, it was a pogrom, but it was also incited by the state. That sure, was but why not to be mean, but were pogroms and were pogroms that exceptional? This is like the history of Jewish people throughout all of Europe already, um, right? A pogrom it was, that's I think it was like it was a state and after Nuremberg, it's, yeah, it was kind of exceptional. And I think as, it was also exceptional in the sense that um, you mentioned concentration camps. So Jewish people were going into camps from 33, but mostly for a secondary reason, like if it was a political disagreement. But after Kristallnacht, that was when people were in like tens of thousands were put into concentration camps, mm -hmm. like just for being Jewish. That was when that uh, that extra escalation happened. So sure. yeah. Okay. Yeah, ben Gurion was a bit fucked up, but you know, anyway. He wasn't saying it in the context of fucking gas chambers. Sure. Okay. Bye. Love you. Wait, the debate starts in one hour, right? When does this debate start? Okay, yeah, chill. It's in my fucking title. Stop asking the question. Oh my fucking god. Minutes of us. And to downgrade the truth to the level of narrative. Now you have two narratives, one of the liar, one of the one who says the truth. But they are at the same level. And this is the problem. Now there is no lion truth anymore. Today there is narrative. And everyone is entitled to his narrative. You know, my narrative is Britain belongs to me. This is my narrative. Why not? Am I entitled to my narrative? So your country belongs to me, and my name is Muhammad. So where is the problem? So, where exactly is the problem? Well, it, for me personally, I, I agree, like the truth matters. But then what I feel like when it comes to a lot of the uh, people I'm, we're talking about is that they, it's not just a rhetorical thing. I think some of it is actually also empirically off. Like I think you mentioned, uh, I think it's either Spencer or Geller, I can't remember, but they talk about like the epidemic of Muslims uh, grooming girls in the UK. But then if I you look at this. data, it's like the overrepresentation is not actually 
it's like slight because I guess the population is younger and there are differences, but they, like, they exaggerate. So they're not really, I don't think, fully telling the truth about what happens either. In all my clips, videos, lectures, writings, you will never find the word epidemic about anybody. Oh, not you. You know what? I, I once wrote about the epidemic, about the coronavirus. Mm. This is the only time when I use the, the epidemic word. Mm. Okay? This is because, you know, there is some, you know, I know that if I want people to listen to me, I have to sound acceptable. Okay? But apart from this, I usually talk about the situation. Well, no, no, thanks Sometimes for Sometimes I will present it in a way which will be easier to others, to the, my listeners, to accept, to swallow. I will cook it maybe a different way. But the content, at the end of the day, will be the same. Whether I speak in Britain, whether I speak in France. Yeah, why did you say five minutes ago then that rhetoric doesn't matter? Yeah. <laughs> whether I speak in the United States, whatever I speak. I show them the situation. Guys, decide for, this, decide for yourself. What? People have a short memory. Septem I mean, I guess you could complain about it and still do it. I do that. And I complain about it and still do it. September 11 never happened. The Fort Hood massacre never happened. What? Does it happen well, for Martians who came from Mars? Okay. Where else would Martians come from? train station in, in, uh, in Madrid, the mas massacre of 300 people never happened. Bataclan, the massacre of two, 2015 in France, the nightclub and the stadium by, by ISIS, uh, those who came from Molenbeek. Disagreement channel. What? What do you want? You're it. Tr Arab tribesmen, what do you want? Uh, just a few things uh, the guy got wrong uh, about the uh, tribal societies and Arabs. Um, the thing is, uh, it is not as much as he's emphasizing how it's, everything is like this tribal thing and people thinking uh, like in 2024 about the tribes and stuff. It's more of uh, uh, old thought and it's not as uh, emphasized in daily life as he wants to uh, betray to everyone like the Emirates solution or whatever. It's just one of those things that are more um, shown in uh, Bedouin life and like um, people who live in uh, rural, uh, rural areas like far away small towns. But it never was a big dominant thing as much he's trying to betray as the entire history of Arabs is like this tribal thing and tribal thing. There was like uh, Bedouins, which uh, that was their um, attitude, which is uh, the family first, the tribe first. But there was also settlements, which is like cities like Jeddah, like um, Damascus and other places uh, that uh, those kind of uh, ties are uh, less or um, completely dissolved. And people even dropped their tribe's name and um, took their family names instead of this tribal thing. Like they emphasized that uh, we are like separate from the tribal thing. We are like under this uh, like king or monarch or a sheikh or like whatever, like uh, in the Islamic days, we're like the caliph. Uh, while other like tribes like kept this attitude of like, no, we're like uh, separate from you all and we are like having our own thing. And so it's not that uh, the way he's betrayed uh, as in, in 2024, Someone in Palestine is like very all about his tribe and stuff. It's not uh, accurate uh, description of the modern day. And it's uh, one of those things that uh, it's accurate, but it's also like accurate in historical context. But it's like putting a microscope on like small portion of the demographic and saying, oh, look, everyone is like that. Everyone is like that, even though it's not the case. Sure. And he's like uh, giving um, an example of like uh, uh, the Gulf countries, which I'm from, uh, that how like one house took over all of this land because, and that's why they're stable and like they have a prosperous country and whatever. And uh, comparing them to places like Syria or Lebanon or even those, uh, and that is not an um, uh, affair. Uh, comparison because uh, their history is different as in Iraq had like a coup and then they had like a corrupt dictator uh, that destroyed the, the entire country and Syria had the same problem. It's not about like no their tribes, it's just that they don't get good democracy. Democracy is just 
Above the air, uh, no, it's not. It's because the system was broken. And when well, I think that was, isn't that dark. the point that he was making was that in those places like Hafez, uh, the Assads or, or the um, Husseins or the people that, I don't even know, the names of the leaders as they were cooing and figuring out their countries that were preceding these people uh, never were representing like strong families or strong tribes as opposed it, to it, all of the, like a lot of the Gulf monarchs representing much stronger families with much like longer lineages or whatever. Isn't that essentially the point that he's making? Like that's where the instability came from? No, no, no. It's more of uh, corruption and um, uh, centralizing the, th uh, the power in one person, uh, like in Saddam and Assad. Yeah, but and I think the reason why he's the reason why I think he would say that that corruption is stemming from the fact that they're not families. They're not oriented around this. They're only looking out for themselves and gaining power for themselves. They don't have any of the familial culture, um, any of the honored stuff that that. Uh, they might have relied on before that. So when you bring in like a foreign person who has no family, who has no relationship here, nobody will respect them. It's literally just like you have to rule by oppressive means. So Saddam, Saddam yeah. and Bashar both are from families that have history in the region. Um, they have ties in like a tribal societies, wherever he wants. Were they to, large, uh, respected, like, huge families? Like yeah, yeah. Uh, Saddam is from Tikrit, and uh -huh. Bashar is from. Um, uh, it's more of a ethnic, not a, a religious. It's a Alawi. Uh, Alawis is a mix of uh, different tribes that adopt this uh, sect of Islam that became its own religion, okay. uh, including my own tribe. They came together and uh, created this kind of, uh, it's, I don't want to say like it's ju Judaism, but it's like mm -hmm. they close in, like they're different and they have a power like um, on the coastal areas of Syria. Okay. Like the places that Russia now uh, put their uh, naval, whatever, like uh, military bases there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Bashar has like power with, uh, within like families and tribes and stuff. But the problem is not that they weren't like, uh, they aren't like representative of tribes. No, they are corrupt. That's the problem. It's corruption that destroyed their uh, uh, credibility and the countries they're, they are ruling right now. So, like, in Iraq, uh, it was, like, first the communist, Abdelkrim Hafez, uh, the guy who did the coup against the monarch. Uh, Iraq used to be a monarchy, Hashimat monarchy, um, like, uh, in Jordan and Morocco. Uh, but there was, like, a communist uh, supported uh, by the Soviets, and they did the coup. Then the coup had the coup. The Soviets, uh, the communists, did the coup on the socialists. And they had this idea of Baathist and secular, which they tried to implement. But the problem was that they were so corrupt and they were so bloodthirsty and so high on their own supply, they started a war with Iran immediately because they wanted more oil. That was the reason for the Iraq-Iran war, uh, war, was because of oil. And that led to, into like desert storm because they wanted uh, debt with Kuwait. And that destroyed Iraq. Uh, destroyed Iraq. Uh, it wasn't like a tribal or respect or, no, it was more of like corrupt countries with corrupt leaders. And when people are desperate, they go back to the roots. So, um, for example, if I'm in ba Baghdad, and like before, uh, before the uh, the collapse of uh, Iraq, I wouldn't care what. Like I'm I'm from the tribe called Thai. You can Wikipedia, uh, okay. and it's a large tribe. It's a large tribe. We are ex uh, we have like uh, all of North Africa, like places in North Africa and Syria and even South America. So uh, I I don't care about that. But when you know shit hits the fan and I need to get like. Uh, what the fuck? Like, it's an anarchy now. So I go back to, you need to go back to something like, uh, to feel secure. So in Iraq after Saddam, Iran started that uh, revolutionary guard, uh, re <coughs> my voice, okay. uh, revolutionary guard, and they uh, started doing this uh, sect war with Shia and Sunni and stuff. And people who were like, okay, I'm Sunni, and, um, but I'm also a tribe, so let me go with my tribe. And that gets more complex because within a tribe, there's like different sects of Islam. So in our tribe, there is even Christian, Christian uh, type people, and there is also Sunni Shia. So within that more of a mixed thing, you feel more secure than being just Sunni. Mm -hmm. Because being Sunni, who will defend you? Like ISIS? They don't, like they kill Sunnis, so they, they don't care. Sure. But if you're with a tribe, no, it's more of like, yeah, that, that's, I know that like we share the fifth uh, a great a great great father or yeah something. fuck yeah wait what was so the name for that again which one the fifth that fifth one there's a name for that I keep forgetting that apparently it's important for you guys uh, for uh, your uh, uh, it's more localized <laughs> we call it Kabila uh, Ashira uh, it's more of uh, uh, small th smaller than a tribe uh, it's like uh, basically it's like saying a state within the United States so instead of saying tribe you say Ashira which is smaller within the tribe so you're more localized so you share like i don't know like uh, 
fifth or twelve grandfathers together, so mm -hmm. it's almost an entire clan within a, cl uh, a tribe. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, gotcha. okay. yeah, so yeah, and also about Islamism and Europe and <laughs> yeah, th whatever he was doing, the uh, protocols of Muslims or whatever he found in within the Muslim Brotherhood. I hate them, by the way, but. Uh, the problem is uh, about radicalization in London is because London hosted a lot of um, uh, extremists uh, during um, the 90s and the early 2000s after the war on terror. A lot of um, uh, like Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and UAE and stuff started prosecuting uh, those extremists and some of them fled into the UK and Europe. And they hosted them because, you know, human rights and like free speech. And they were like trying to speak in this repressive regime. And they hosted them. And those people uh, went into mosques and started like preaching their extremist ideology. So you get people like hijab and the other radical motherfuckers that um, speak in London and radicalize people. So now we are in a situation where most of foreign f fighters <laughs> coming to war, like uh, for ISIS and stuff in Syria and the Middle East, are like British and like... Oh wow, sure. German. Have you? Um, yeah, it's there was a. Mm. a oh fuck! I don't remember. Bandar, um, Bandar, the ambassador from Saudi Arabia, speaks about that a lot yeah, when yeah, he was on yeah. American media. And uh, American media was like, "Why did you let all these Saudis like hijack our planes? Like this is bullshit." And he's like, "What do you mean? We prosecuted all of these people. That's why they all came from like Afghanistan. Like they didn't. They weren't in uh, like uh, Bin Laden or whatever. wasn't in Saudi Arabia. Like he had already been chased came out of through here Yemen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yemen to Sudan, then th to Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. And now they're pointing to Islam and saying, "Yeah, look, all Muslims in this and that." No, you you literally picked the worst of the worst and put them and hosted them and gave them like a platform to preach without any like restrictions or any like you need to chill and now you have a problem with hijab is w way way too extremist he's saying like countries like saudi arabia are like infidel country uh, and it's insane to say something like uh, like that coming from you know supposed to british person now is <laughs> is more extremist than the people living here so it's insane how much uh, uh, I don't know, like, uh, how he twisted it into, like, no, all, oh, and, like, immigration jihad. It's the first, this is the first time in my life I'm hearing that. Immigration jihad is, like, everything is jihad. And jihad yeah, is because it feels like when people come here, I think Lonerbach said it, too, that, like, your more radicalized people are usually, like, your second or third generation. It's people, like, young men that end up feeling dispossessed or get radicalized. It's not like they're coming over here as, like, super radical jihadists that want to, like, breed, like, super radical jihadists. Exactly, because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, families want to, you know, to teach their kids, like, the language and stuff. And most schools are mosques, like, for teaching Arabic in Europe and uh, uh, England. So they send their kids, you know, to learn the language or whatever, like, to have a second language or stuff. And they get, like, basically gifted into, to those radicals who basically just, like, teach them this evil ideology and evil hate uh, like how can you hate the country that hosted you and gave you like a citizenship and uh, you're supposed to love the place you're born in this is your country and no they hate this pl like the places they are in because that's where they were taught and also the uh, us versus them like when you feel unaccepted if you're like uh, african immigrant a muslim immigrant into like immigrated to england and you don't feel belonged and you go to this mosque that uh, this uh, radical imam is preaching this evil ideology so if you you're more like uh, your hate is more justified and now you have something to live for like yeah I will just like bring back the caliphate and we will be based and stuff and it's it's just uh, una uh, uh, unfair and inaccurate to describe it to everyone like uh, as the guy your uh, Lauren Box was interviewing as just like everyone is this mindset no <laughs> it's only the UK it's the problem for some reason is just like spreading this uh, and uh, meanwhile in America uh, I've seen like uh, the, um, there's uh, on YouTube lectures from mosques in America they're more chill they're like so chill and they're like peace and love peace and love everyone because uh, uh, the restrictions to immigrate to America they know if you're like a fucking radical they will send you to Guantanamo and you will know how to preach there so there is like a filtering thing, but uh, meanwhile in Europe there is no filtering, and they're more shy to. Uh, there is a speech if you can find it on YouTube from uh, Ben Zaid. Uh, I think he's uh, uh, now the governor of uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, talking about ra radicalization and how Europe is not facing that, how mu and not taking uh, the steps that we did in the Gulf 
which is just like exterminate them. You, you don't need those preachers. You need to not give them like a, like is, they're like fascists. They're worse than fascists because they infect your youth with this uh, like almost a death cult of like let's just bring hell to earth and bring everything to uh, burn everything to the ground and bring from the ashes, bring back the caliphate, which is one of those like, uh, the ideology that brought basically like the entire war on terror, like blood and stuff, and it's evil ideology that wants just to destroy everything, and they're let it loose in the name of like uh, tolerance or like uh, we don't want to be like uh, ex not extreme, we don't want to be like anti-Muslim and stuff. Meanwhile, they are the most victims of those, uh, uh, the most victims of those ideo uh, that ideology is Muslims because. The, uh, if you see it like uh, in countries like Saudi Arabia, there is a terror attack of a terror attack until we face that and we exterminate them. We had none. So that's why uh, you have a lot of problems cool. with Muslims there. OK, Unlike I appreciate what it. Was saying. I got it. I think. Okay. Gotcha. I appreciate gotcha. it. I love you. Thank you for this. I have to finish this for the beginning. But oh, thank thanks. You. sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Wait, are you from? Uh, do you say are you from Saudi Arabia? Can you say that or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I'm from Saudi Arabia. OK, Ciao. all right. I'll be careful. Bye. Ciao. OK. In, in, in Brussels. Um, what, these things never happened? Let alone what happens here in the Middle East. But th look, look at what happened. N no British citizen went to ISIS to fight with, uh, with the jihadists and came back only because of human rights? How many of those jihadists came back? What are they going to be now? Lawyers and accountants? What do you think? After they trained themselves to slaughter people. What was the huge, there was a huge deal with, uh, was it a girl who went to fight for ISIS or to be a mom in ISIS and then tried to come back to Britain? But I think Britain wanted to renounce her citizenship, but she didn't have citizenship anywhere else. So the international community was like, you can't make people stateless or. On air with this Amwazi guy from East London, who was the chief slaughter in, in Iraq and, and Syria. You remember him? This guy yeah. with the knife. Okay. Shamimi, Shamima, Begum. Okay. Oh, you try not to. Uh, what happened in the Charlie Hebdo uh, headquarters of the newspaper? People like Norm Finkelstein that like implicitly almost, I don't want to say defend the Charlie Hebdo killings, but like excuse it. That shit is wild to me. As an American free speech guy, when I hear people even remotely coming close to defending that, like, Bro, what? What happened in the uh, Hippel Kasher in, in, uh, in Paris? Yes, and one Muslim rescued Jews, yes, in the, in the refrigerator. And he saved their life. Th I have not enough words to thank the man, to thank him for the, what he did. He was, he's a real man, as we say. He's a real human being. Yes, and I'm not trying to generalize to say all the Muslims are, are, are killers. I, I, I'm the last man on earth to say it. Here in Israel, we have Muslim soldiers in the IDF, okay? But what I'm saying is that this mass migration, which is almost unlimited in some European countries, is going to be more and more, thanks to the birth rate, and while the Europeans are getting less and less. And you decide if this is the Britain or France or Belgium or Holland or Spain, which you want to leave to your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, if you're going to have any. Because Europeans, in many cases, don't have children. And you have to, this as a nation, should decide. Now, the worst, in some cases, are the politicians. Why? Because in many, I think in all the European countries, the elections are regional. You know, the country is divided to constituencies. And uh, every constituency sends its delegates to the, to the parliament, to the local parliament, to the general parliament. Oh, shit. Before we, 10 minutes of this. Something that I was thinking about a lot, because um, something that, like, burned a hole in my mind is the idea that in Israel, that Knesset, there is no geography recognized in the Israeli government. It, could there be some sort of, like, Senate, like, upper body that, like, has, like, 40 delegates from the West Bank and Gaza and 60 from, like, Israel proper? Like, if you, if you had, like, an upper parliamentary body like that, could you have a one-state solution that theoretically fix things? Because your, your land of Israel proper would always be, uh, like, a Jewish majority, and you'd always have at least your 60 seats from your upper body there to prevent, like, crazy country-destroying things. Like, I don't know. Whenever a neighborhood becomes 
Islamized. Anyone who wants to be elected has to cater for them. More benefits, as you say in, in, in Britain, benefits. Okay? So the candidates actually are competing with each other. Who will give them more? Oh, so why not come to, the, to, to Britain? Why not come to France? Why? Look, uh, take, take a tour in neighborhoods like Barbès in France, in, in Paris, uh, Saint-Saint-Denis, Molenbeek in Brussels. Who is somebody that you're interested in debating on this issue? Um, not to sound uh, full of hubris, uh, but at this point it would just be people that I think spread a lot of misinformation that need to get destroyed. Um, I don't think there's any mainstream political debater, uh, pundit or whatever, that talks with any like understanding of this issue. It's All the conversations are incredibly fucking stupid. Uh, for every single person, basically, that I've heard speak about it in any of the mainstream circles. So if I wanted to debate any of them, it would just be to obliviate. Malmo in Sweden. Go and look by yourself. Take a camera. In most cases, the one, they will not let you take, take videos in these places. Of where? And I want loot in, this, in Sweden. Oh. Go and look by yourself. Take a camera. In most cases, the one, they will not let you take, take videos in these places. And you know what? Look. My, my time in Malmo was super chill. I don't know. Maybe there are scarier parts of Malmo that I just didn't see, but... In the city. Parts of Leeds, parts of Liverpool, Birmingham. Look at what happens there. Don't ignore. It's your country. It's not mine. Honey. Yeah, I agree. I agree that there's... Um, I feel like with ever, like any kind of change like that, there's going to be challenges. Sorry, do you have time for like a couple more questions? If you're like... Can you shut on Sam Harris's take? The subreddit is currently glazing him. I got to get down to pointing out this religious analysis. Of, uh, Sam Harris will, will always be... Sam Harris's mindfuck moment, although it's not as bad as other people's mindfuck moments, because most people's mindfuck moments make their entire politics become retarded. So Jordan Peterson and like the C-16 bill, or Brett Eric Weinstein, and um, the COVID vax shit, uh, Joe Rogan and the Ivermectin stuff... Um, because everybody has their mindfuck moments. I think for Sam Harris, I think it was Islam was his mindfuck moment. But it doesn't it doesn't somehow like infect the rest of his politics, which I think is good generally. So I don't know how long we've gone for. Yeah, you okay for a couple more? Okay. Um, so I feel like for me, there's like the challenge is um, what do you do with the situation that they have, right? So I think in the in Europe, uh, when about 2010, when I was just starting university. Uh, the Muslim population in the UK was 4%. Now it's 6.5. It's like fair growth. And, up. sorry? Up. Yeah, it's high. Um, so my question is, um, when it comes to what you do about that and also just like understanding, I guess, where the radicalization in those like second generations come from, uh, I feel mm -hmm. like there's sometimes a misconception about uh, that their motivation is like, to do with a strict adherence to their religion and not just a more modern phenomenon. So an example that I came across was that uh, the guy who led the 7-7 bombings in London, I think before he was radicalized, he was actually such a bad conventional Muslim that he was disowned by his family for marrying someone that he met in university. Um, and I, I think you hear stories about... Yeah, I think you hear stories about people from ISIS as they get very interested in what they say is like Islam, but then people go to Syria to fight in ISIS, and they're very surprised to see that people there don't even know how to pray properly. What percentage of confidence would you say you have that Harris is wrong on the Islam thing? Being a major component of this, probably like 90%. It's, very, it's quite high at this point. Um, yeah. Or, um, or they listen to like jihadi rap. Is Sam Harris's Israel-Palestine analysis literally just Islam bad, or am I oversimplifying it? No, I don't think his analysis is that crude. I, I feel like he overplays it, but I don't think it's like, I don't think that he's like super bad or off on it. I would have to listen to his most recent thing. I just think he overplays it a bit, but I don't think he's like, yeah, you know, ultra crazy. That's it, yeah. Which is full of things that are not really uh, considered um, halal. So it's like, um, I wonder, uh, do you think the answer to that is you stop immigration from the Muslim world to Europe completely? Is there failures in integration? Because I feel like some countries do it better than others. Or, and maybe another question tied into that is, Where's this post uh, my if you consider 6.5% of the British population being Muslim as a demographic threat, do you feel the same way about a fifth of Israel being Arab? Well, first of all, Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, in order not to generalize, to say all Muslims are dot, 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 I already say, 
many of the Muslim migrants are fully uh, integrated to a degree that many of them would eat anything which comes to the plate and would drink anything which is poured to the glass. To that degree, they are integrated. They left almost everything which contacted them, which combined them with their past in the Islamic and the Arab world. Many of them are culturally uh, uh, integrated. With them, nobody has a problem. Nobody should have a problem. And the, I would think the, the best uh, you know, example of this, these are the former Minister of Justice of France, like 20 years ago, a lady named Rashida Dati. A lady originally, her family came from Morocco, and uh, she was a great lawyer, and Sarkozy, the president, nominated to be the Minister of Justice. And she was not married. And while she was a, a minister, she got pregnant. Now, in France, unlike other countries, you look at this part of the human being. All the other parts is not your, not, not your business, not, not of your business. And in France, it's okay. If a French lady is pregnant, it's her, it's her own business. You deal with her face, that's all. And you are not even allowed to talk about this, so it's not your business. However, the Islamic co community in France, for them, this issue is rather problematic. Because the lady who is not married cannot be pregnant. Okay? So, uh, for her, she, and she did because she was French. Totally French. Okay? So, this is actually how deep some part of this Islamic migration are fully integrated into the culture of the hosting country. Nobody should have any problem with these people. Wait, did something are. bad happen to her? Fuck, I didn't catch the name. Did she get like killed or something or? No, she was just, yeah, she's French. Rashida Dati. Oh, she's still alive. Okay, because I never mentioned much about it. Okay. Be they became British or French or whatever, uh, culturally. The problem is with those who move to Europe, but they refuse to become U Europeans in their culture. And this is where the problem lies. And this is the problem, because now you, you have to de develop all kinds of theories like multiculturalism, which works. I'm not sure that it can work. Because many things which you deem as sacred, they don't even believe it. You feel, in, you feel that freedom of speech is sacred. They don't feel freedom of speech. What against Islam? Can you, can you draw a, a caricature against, against most Prophet Muhammad? You're not allowed. While for you to draw pictures or caricatures is... Ask McBlast. Thanks for the 10 gifted subs. Part of your freedom of speech. Okay, many things which for you are the basics of how, what is to be British, for them it's something which is totally, unf totally unacceptable because their background and they didn't make this move, the cultural move into the British culture. And this is where the problem is. And uh, now, since they are not willing to be integrated, now what they complain that they are out of the British, what, culture? They don't want to be part of the British culture. They don't accept it. What, they sit in pubs? They don't sit in pubs. And show me one British who doesn't sit in pub once in a while. Okay? For them, the pub is the source of all evil. Because in Islam, somebody who gets drunk, he will kill, he will betray his wife, and he will do everything which is against the religion. 
And the alcohol is the source of all evil, according to the Islamic uh, discourse. Okay? So the pub is actually the place <laughs> which all the evil comes from, according to their, to their thinking. Okay? Is this a British? Somebody who thinks that the pub is something which you, should, you shouldn't even look at. Never mind to smell or even to walk and to drink. Oh, who, who, who would think about this? Okay, so this is what I mean. The problem is that the migration of a society which does, what, does not want to be integrated, does, want to, does not want to adopt the culture and the values and the, what, everything which the absorbing uh, 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 culture is so generously want to give. They don't want it. They don't like it. They hate it. Look at the, your neighbor, uh, Anjam Shudri, what he's saying. We came to Britain in order to bring Islam to Europe. Is, uh, Islam for the UK. This is his organization. He doesn't want the British idol-worshipping name democracy. And I quote him. He wants Islam. Buckingham Palace should turn into a mosque. Okay? This is what he wants to do. And he do you agree with this? Um, there are like elements of truth to what he says, but there's some things that I disagree with. Um, <clears throat> something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the past probably like six months, because uh, it comes up a lot in the Israel-Palestine thing, like the importance of like an ethnic group or whatever. Um, one of the things that one of the things that I challenged to Nick Fuentes to a lot of the alt writers a long time ago when they were talking about defending the uh, unified American ethnicity, we have a unified like culture or something. And I would always challenge them, tell me what makes for a unified American culture. Cause you guys always say that you've got, you know, a unified uh, American culture that you're trying to defend from foreign immigrants. Well, can you explain what that is? Tell me what like people in San Francisco have in common with people in uh, you know, like rural Louisiana or something. And they were never able to answer that question ever. Like they never, they were never able to give me an answer to that question. So my pushback would always be that like, I don't know if there's like some kind of like, I don't know if there's some amorphous idea or some nebulous idea about being an American, some intangible thing that, you know, is that we're trying to protect from like a foreign invader or from a foreign population. That, that would always be my go-to. I would always, I just don't know. I, no, one, no one was ever able to give me an answer. I started thinking about this a lot more in the past six months. And I think there actually is a shared character in America that is worth defending, um, even at the ex exclusion of some people joining the country and everything. Um, but I realize now why people like uh, Fuentes and other alt writers could never give it, and it's because they wouldn't be included in what I believe to be like the core ideology of America. Uh, and I truly do believe that it is built on like core concepts of liberalism. Uh, these ideas that no one person is greater than another person, uh, that we, you know, our rights come from God, uh, you know, in a fucking, in a secularized sense, that one race isn't better than another, one gender isn't better than another, uh, that we, we have to have like huge values on these things like freedom of speech, you know, the right one man, one vote, um, and yes, even one woman, one vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like, but, but kind of like these core liberal ideas that the country is built around. Um, I think that it is important to have that character of your nation. And I think that that is an important thing to defend. So insofar as what he's talking about here, uh, I think that there is a huge issue with people on the far left of this. It, it manifests in this way of people saying like, no culture is better than any other culture. Bullshit. Uh, there are some cultures that I would rather have in my country. There's a culture that I believe that my country should have, or at least some core fundamental values in my culture. And there are other cultures uh, that, I, that I, I don't value, uh, at least not existing in my country and probably not existing at all, depending on what we're talking about. Um, when people say that thing, like, oh, no culture is better than any other culture. Okay, well, what about Nazi culture? Like, do, are they all equal, really? Um, so people that defend, uh, and whether it comes from Muslims or from Christians, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, probably more from Christians than Muslims. Um, in Europe, maybe more from Muslims than Christians. Any defending of people's ability to commit like acts of terrorism against people who exercise freedom of speech in a way that they don't like, that should never be protected. That should be seen as a core un-American thing. So whether that means uh, January 6thers, 6th -er, 6th -ers, would that be the word? January 6thers uh, trying to break into the Capitol building because they don't like the results of the election to overthrow it, or whether that means uh, you know BLM rioters trying to burn down buildings uh, you know, past curfew. Uh, these are types of things that I believe are uh, antithetical to which if there is an American nation or if there is like an ethno-national core to our identity, it has to be built on those types of liberal 
ideas. Uh, and if they're not, then we lose what the country was essentially founded on. You're creating something or you're going in a direction that is fundamentally different than where we came from, which is also, I guess, not the worst. Like the country can change. Um, I think that would be a change for the worst. But uh, I mean, countries change over time. But yeah, I think that the uh, I think that um, I think that the country is uniquely awesome probably one of the coolest countries in the world, maybe in all of history, as a result of those values that we built and the things that we've accomplished and achieved here. Uh, I don't think that a, a, an illiberal foundation, like the kind that Fuentes wants to build or, or Marxists or commies want to build, I don't think that those could produce the same outcomes that the United States has. But Maybe I'm retarded. Doesn't this go against your stance from your last Rose Risk debate about critiquing other countries? What's the difference? What? Did I say that in my last debate? I said that I don't think I feel comfortable imposing our rule of law or imposing our way of life on other countries. I don't, did I say I don't think I would ever critique any other country? If I said that, that would be retarded to say, but i um, pretty sure what I said was I just don't think like imposing our, our way of living on other people is a lot more difficult. His followers, how many followers does he have? Handful or bucket full? Okay. It's you, it's, I, I don't know. But look at what happens in, 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 in Britain. How many of those, and this is really a good, good, good question to be researched. How, what is the percentage of the migrants who came to the West in, in, in general or to Britain in particular in order to become British by culture? Now, it's not yes or no. It is a whole spectrum between those who couldn't care less about what they eat and what they drink, and Anjum Shudri on the other side. Everybody is, in in certain point, on this continuum, on this spectrum. The more you have to the side which accepts the idea of becoming British... Wow, Rick, thanks for the 15 months of subscription. The buddy. better it for, for Britain, or to the sustainability of the state as a British state. Do you think that European countries have a more ethnically focused unifying element, as you put it? Their history is more geographic based, geography based, as opposed to the US that was founded on principles? No, I think that European countries in general have shifted more and more in that direction. Their monarchies are weaker, even if they still exist. They have no effect of power. They've all moved towards these parliamentary bodies. I think roughly speaking, like the Western world uh, shares the same set of like foundational capitalistic democratic liberal values. Um, it might manifest a bit differently from one country to the next, but I think broadly speaking, we're kind of a similar, and these were probably solidified, my guess would be over like the course of the Cold War and everything as well. Uh, it'd be like my, my feeling. While if the weight goes to the other side, you are in a deep problem. Well, on the topic of drinking, I do think British people need to drink less, but maybe we can meet in the middle on that. Um, Dr. Kadar? Look, uh, it's a matter of, you know what, if to quote your sources, to be or not to be. Well, Dr. Kadar, I really appreciate the time. It was nice talking to Pleasure. you. Pleasure. Thank you. Wow, cute. Okay, um, I love you guys. Uh, just as a warning, in like 20 minutes, I have to kill my YouTube stream because I think that uh, CNN or whoever's hosting this debate, I think they are aggressively DMCAing people that are watching it, so I can only watch it on kick. So just give me your heads up. Probably ending my YouTube stream in like 20 minutes. Um, October 7th, Sam Harris. Oh, boy. Maybe I'll read this later. A reading from the book of Joshua. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spake unto Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan. Forty thousand prepared for war, went before the Lord unto battle, into ye plain of Jericho. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they- Wow, Stinkfist570, thanks for the five good subs. 
of the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. They burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. The book of Joshua is required reading in Israeli schools today. The book holds an important place because in its pages many people think that a precedent can be found for the establishment of Israel as a nation. The book of Joshua provided the muscular and militaristic dimension of conquest and the annihilation of the Canaanites and other ancient peoples that populated the Promised Land. Hi, my name is GDF, and you can probably- Oof, okay, we're already off to a rough start in that we are sourcing the Old Testament for modern Israeli uh, politics or foundation, but okay. We tell by the direction that this video is going in that I'm not very advertiser friendly. For that reason, I rely completely on my patrons, subscribers, and donations. Following. Um, we'll watch this up to five minutes, I guess. In the creation of the state of Israel, biblical archaeology became an obsession. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben Gurion, was, as were almost all of the earliest contemporary Zionists, an atheist. Although many early Jewish Zionists were secular, socialists, and atheists, the biblical narrative was an appealing way of legitimizing the Zionist movement. Upon assuming his role as first premier, the biblical narrative an atheist. Although many early Jewish Zionists were secular, socialists, and atheists, the biblical narrative was an appealing way of legitimizing the Zionist movement. Wait, what is this quote from? Is this an appealing way of legitimizing the Zionist movement to Jews, or an appealing a way of making it appeal to other Christians? The biblical narrative um, was an appealing way of legitimizing... Maybe he'll give it... A, I'll read it in a second. Upon assuming his role as first premier, cementing his legacy as Israel's founding father, Ben-Gurion organized Bible study classes in his official residence, and was instrumental in making the study of the Book of Joshua a major component of the school curriculum in Israel. It was this atheist socialist Ben-Gurion who declared to the Peel Commission in 1936 that the Bible is our mandate, and was later quoted as declaring, Though I reject theology, the single most important book in my life is the Bible. Using a nationalist interpretation, the Bible came to become a course material, taught as immutable fact to school children. The Bible came to serve as the first history book to be studied by all school children within the Zionist community in Palestine as well as, under the auspices of the Israeli education system, within the modern state of Israel, as well as being taken for granted by the scientific community and academia generally. From a collection of theological texts incorporating historical plots and divine miracles aimed at inculcating faith in its readers. I'm just curious where this quote came from. The biblical narrative was a, an appealing way of legitimizing... Sources. Book of Joshua. Whose land, whose promise? Gary Burge. Oof, that sounds like a... The Bible and Zionism, invented traditions, archaeology, and post-colonialism in Palestine, Israel, from Nur Masala. Damn, these titles, oof. The silencing of Palestinian history. Deconstructing the walls of Jericho, biblical myth and archeological reality. The invention of the land, damn. Okay. on paper to communicate with other Christians who share the same opinions he does and seek answers to the same questions he does. Questions such as, how do I embrace my commitment to Judaism, a commitment to which I am bound by the Bible, when I sense in my deepest being that there is a profound injustice afoot in Israel? Interesting. Okay. Sorry. Two more minutes. It became a compilation of historiographic texts that bore only a smattering of optional religious meaning. So ingrained was the Bible in schooling by 1992 that Benjamin Beit Halachmi, professor of psychology at the University of Haifa, could write, most Israelis today, as a result of Israeli education, regard the Bible as a source of reliable historic information of a secular, political kind. And it remained that way even into the 21st century, to the point that, under no circumstances is it permissible to skip over the book of Joshua. Moreover, even though the teaching of this past has been proven ethically and pedagogically destructive, the Israel is that is this true in Israel? Do you guys, like, study the book of Joshua as history? Where are my Israelis at? Does this happen? The Israeli education system refuses to exclude from the curriculum these shameful accounts of extermination. 
After all, David Ben-Gurion had repeatedly invoked the Book of Joshua to justify the massacres and ensuing ethnic cleansing carried out under the guise of the 1948 war. But even before 1948, the excavation of Palestine was oh, under- Oh shoot, it's late. They're sleeping, you're right. ...way during the mandatory period starting in 1917. Indeed, under British control, the first cleansing carried out under the guise of the 1948 war curriculum, these shameful accounts of extermination. After all, David Ben-Gurion had repeatedly invoked the Book of Joshua to justify the massacres and ensuing ethnic cleansing carried out under the guise of the 1948 war. The guise of the 1948 war? That's a really bad account of that, but okay. But even before 1948, the excavation of Palestine was underway during the mandatory period starting in 1917. Indeed, under British control, the first archaeological crusader seeking to dig up the Holy Land as told by the Bible was none other than the American William Foxwell Albright. His legacy as one of the most influential biblical scholars of the 20th century makes his worldview all the more disturbing. As a fundamentalist, Albright did not doubt stories like the Book of Joshua, and even justified them. In those days, warfare was total, and we Americans have perhaps less right than most modern nations to sit in judgment on the Israelites of the 13th century BC, since we have, intentionally or otherwise, exterminated scores of thousands of Indians in every corner of our great nation and have crowded the rest into great concentration camps. It often seems necessary that a people of markedly inferior type should vanish before a people of superior potentialities, since there is a point beyond which racial mixture cannot go without disaster. Thus the Canaanites, with their orgiastic nature worship, their cult of fertility in the form of serpent symbols and sensuous nudity, and their gross mythology, were replaced by Israel, with its pastoral simplicity and purity of life, its lofty monotheism and its severe code of ethics. In the oral simplicity, serpent symbols and sensuous, thus the superior potentialities, since there is a point beyond which racial mixture cannot go without disaster. Thus the Canaanites, with their orgiastic nature worship, their cult of fertility in the form of serpent symbols and sensuous nudity, and their gross mythology— was, Were the people that were living in the, in the early 1900s in the Ottoman Empire, in the Levant, considered, like, Canaanites who did these worshiping? I've never heard this in my life. I've never heard any—like, up to the, fir the first five and a half minutes of this are going over things I've, like, never come across in any part of my reading this much, this obsession with the Bible. I've never seen this anywhere. It could be a huge blind spot of mine. Or he's like very selectively. This guy's only talking about 1300 BC. We were replaced by Israel with its power. Isn't it kind of weird to talk about people at 1300 BC being replaced by people in the year 1917? That's that seems like pastoral simplicity and purity of life. It's lofty monotheism and its severe code of ethics. In the or is he talking about these are the ancient ancient? Oh, never mind. He, he's he's talking about all of this is ancient, right? Serpent symbols and sensuous nudity and their gross mythology were replaced by Israel with its pastoral simplicity. My bad. Okay. When he says Israel, he means like the kingdom of Israel. Oh, okay. My bad. I city and purity of okay. life. It's lofty monotheism and its severe code gotcha, of ethics. Gotcha, okay. In the words of revisionist biblical scholar Keith Whitelam of the University of Sterling, this justification by one of the great icons of 20th century biblical scholarship of the slaughter of the indigenous Palestinian population is remarkable for two reasons. Wait, but of 20th century biblical scholarship of the slaughter of the indigenous Palestinian population is remarkable for two reasons. It is an outpouring of undisguised racism which is staggering, but equally startling is the fact that this statement is never referred to or commented on, as far as I know, by biblical scholars in their assessments of the work of Albright. Was he using that to justify... Okay. There's just one glaring problem with Foxwell's analysis, and further the foundational texts justifying the Zionist project and the creation of the State of Israel. It's all bullshit. And I think in a Jewish nation, I don't think, um, I don't think Herzl, there might be other, maybe I, I think he wrote a second book that has to do specifically with the foundation of Israel. I don't think he brings up the Bible a single time. I, I don't remember seeing it ever. Slaughter as told in the book of Joshua never happened, and the stories of the Israelites in the Bible are not even remotely historically accurate. It was 1999 when Zave Herzog, professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University, who at one time was the director of their Institute of Archaeology, wrote a piece for the weekly Haaretz magazine titled Deconstructing the Walls of Jericho. His words were difficult ones for biblical literalists. Following 70 years of intensive excavations in the land of Israel, archaeologists have found out the Israelites did not sojourn in Egypt, did not wander in the wilderness, did not conquer the land of Canaan in a military campaign, oh. and did not pass it on to the 12 tribes of Israel. Additionally, as opposed to the long-held claim of a sovereign united kingdom of Israel, the united monarchy of David and Solomon, which was described in the Bible as a regional superpower, was, at most, a small tribal kingdom. Herzog describes the ascent of William Foxwell Albright in the 1920s, and later, following the establishment of the State of Israel, the founding fathers of Israeli archaeology, including Benjamin Mazar, Naaman Avigad, Yigal Yadin, and others. Herzog writes that using the Bible as a literal guide to exploring the Bronze and Iron Ages was standard practice from the beginning, which would continue for decades. However, writes Herzog, little by little, cracks began to appear in the picture. To take one example, the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, wandering for 40 years across the Sinai. 
Many Egyptian documents known to us do not mention at all the sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt or the later exodus of an entire people, which was curious considering the Egyptians kept highly detailed records, which included even small incursions. Many documents mention the practice of wandering shepherds to enter Egyptian territory in times of drought or famine and to settle at the fringe. As explained in a helpful article for the New York Review of Books by Avishai Margali, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Hebrew University, Margali points out that the founding of Jerusalem predates Islam, Christianity, and in fact Judaism itself. It is thought that Jerusalem was founded about 4,000 years ago as a city of ritual worship by the Canaanites. Jumping ahead thousands of years, Zionism had ambitions to create a new Jewish society, but Jerusalem was the least appropriate place for the founding of such a new society. Most of the Jerusalem Jews were part of an ultra-Orthodox community of the sort that the Zionists were rebelling against, a community that lived on donations and did not have the kind of productive life that the Zionist revolution aspired to. It is no wonder then that the Zionists preferred to build the new Hebrew city in the golden sands of Tel Aviv. Most of the immigrants to Israel, about 80%, settled along the Mediterranean coast, a region that had never been the historic homeland of the Jewish people. It appears this ambivalence is a historic trend. Unlike Christianity, Judaism does not regard the pilgrimage to Jerusalem as an act of penance for transgressions, or an act that can purify the believer, and we therefore find no recommendation that it be implemented. The data appear to illustrate this point further. We know of approximately 30 texts that provide accounts of Jewish pilgrimage during the 1700 years between 135 CE and the mid-19th century. By contrast, for the 1500 years between 333 CE and 1878, we have some 3,500 reports of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land. These words are at stark odds with the Israeli Proclamation of Independence issued at Tel Aviv on May 14, 1948. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people remained faithful to it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return. Exiled from their land is, of course, a reference to the story of the Roman Empire. Wait, what? How is that contradictory? Empire <laughs> because they didn't do pilgrimages to it? Jews from their province of Judea. This foundational myth is the source of the theory that the Jewish diaspora the world over can trace their ancestry to Palestine. Therein lies their claim to the land and the reason why Jewish immigrants Wait, that the Jewish what? story of the Roman and never cease to pray oh. and hope for their return. Exiled from their land is, of course, a reference to the story of the Roman Empire exiling Jews from their province of Judea. This foundational myth is the source of the theory that the Wait, wait does he think that there was no kingdom of Israel or that this never happened? I thought this wasn't really contested history. Jewish diaspora the world over can trace their ancestry to Palestine. Therein lies their claim to the land and the reason why Jewish immigrants, wherever they may be, are said to be returning to their homeland when moving to Israel. Authoritative experts on Jewish history take issue with this theory, to put it plainly, not least of which being Israel Yuval, professor of Jewish history at Hebrew University. From his The Myth of the Jewish Exile from the Land of Israel, the Romans, like any victorious army, customarily took prisoners, but they did not have a policy of exiling conquered nations from their lands. According to Josephus's probably inflated figures, 1.1 million were killed in Jerusalem, and about 97,000 were captured. Many of these met their deaths in battles with animals and in circus entertainments. Others died of hunger. But otherwise, the Jews were left in place. They emigrated from the land of Israel during the first centuries of the first millennium in a slow and gradual process, and not as the result of an intentional policy on the part of the Roman and Byzantine authorities. The myth remained and was given credence when in the 4th century... Or well, but if there was, if their kingdom was annihilated and they weren't allowed to, like, rule in some, any autonomous way anymore, I mean, isn't that kind of the same thing? All right, switch over to kick. Um, <clears throat> yep, I'm cutting my YouTube stream. Good luck. Uh, Kick.com slash destiny. Riverino. Kick.com slash destiny. I'll be right back. One sec.